I would like to welcome all of you to this online symposium, Tolerance and Intolerance in Israel, Palestine, Religion, Plurality and Difference. My name is uh, Christian Wiese. I'm teaching modern Jewish thought at Frankfurt University. Um, and um, I particularly, particularly also welcome Kama Ben Yohanan as uh, the co-organizer uh, of this event and our four speakers Menachem Lobabaum from Tel Aviv, but who is speaking from Jerusalem, Erika Weiss from Tel Aviv, Nitzan Libovitz from Pennsylvania, and Merav Jones, who is going to come in later because it's very early in Canada uh, in the morning. This symposium, apart from addressing a most relevant uh, intellectual and political topic, carries a specific meaning for many of us. It is devoted to our dear friend and colleague, Dr. Roy Ben Bassat, who so tragically passed away a year ago on November 11, 2019, after a long battle with illness. On behalf of all of us, I would like to warmly welcome members of Roy's family who are present here today, a day after his yardside, and friends from different parts of his life. It is a great privilege to have you here today. And I know that these days are overshadowed with great sadness and that there are no words that I, that we could offer to express the terrible loss Roy's death must mean for you, means for you. With this symposium, we have chosen to remember Roy Ben Bassat as a scholar, as a person, as a friend, and to celebrate his life in a way I hope he would have appreciated by joining together today and discussing what he was passionate about, what his scholarly interests were devoted to. You all, family, friends, colleagues, those of you who have met Rui will have your very personal memories. I personally first met him in November 2013 at a conference devoted to Jewish readings of Søren Kierkegaard. And I got to know him as the philosophical mind he was, as the thinker who was so strongly interested in the intellectual links between Jewish thought and European philosophy. And so I was delighted when he came to Frankfurt in 2017 and joined my team and became a member of the interdisciplinary research project that I will briefly characterize later in my remarks. I fondly remember the many dialogues we had about the relationship between philosophy and intellectual history, about politics, about the meaning and about the directions our project was taking over the years. And when thinking about Rui, I think about the many facets of his personality that I perceived and that I would like to share with you very briefly, knowing that all of you perceive different things. I remember Roy as somebody who really had something to say, an astute independent thinker with firm views when it came to his philosophical approach, but also with the ability to listen to other perspectives with an admirable openness, calm and kindness when engaging in discussions with colleagues, be it in individual conversations or in our colloquia in the group. I remember Roy as an important member of our team at the Buber Chair in Jewish Philosophy and of the larger project. In many ways, he was at the intellectual center of this intellectual and interdisciplinary project. With his intellectual rigor as a colleague, as a mentor to many, he also was a brilliant teacher. And I know from students how much he inspired many, leaving a mark on their intellectual outlook, and even on their future philosophical interests. However, there's another dimension to his role, which is even more important. I remember him, as we all do in Frankfurt, as the kind human being he was, a mensch in Yiddish terms. He was fun to be with. And I have wonderful memories about his humor and his irony, which we all enjoyed uh, often. I know, and we witnessed it, that family was so important to him. In Israel, 
where he then returned to in order to undergo treatment and his family in Berlin. We saw him commuting, sharing his time between Frankfurt and Berlin and taking care of his son, Dory. I remember his kindness and empathy, the way he demonstrated that he was truly interested in his friends and colleagues. He loved to spend time with them. He was the first who visited and saw Nina Fischer's newly born son, Adam. Even during the final month of his life, he enjoyed the visit of one of our colleagues. He kept in touch and asked about developments within the group and how the project was unfolding. It is only after his death that I found out that he did not only love and actively play music, but what a truly extraordinary musician he was himself and that he also recorded music. And we will hear one of his songs in a few minutes. But let me say something about Roy's involvement in this interdisciplinary project in Frankfurt. The project is basically devoted to religious plurality, difference, dialogism, and conflict. It carries the somewhat, somewhat complicated title, religious positioning, modalities, and constellations in Jewish, Christian, and Islamic contexts from a variety of historical, theological, philosophical, as well as sociological and political perspectives, the project explores the many facets of religious plurality and diversity, as well as religious difference, which are fundamental categories of interreligious and intercultural encounters. And we have done that with a focus on the three monotheistic religions. In contrast to interreligious concepts of pluralism and dialogue, aiming at relativizing or eclipsing differences and antagonisms, the underlying assumption of this project is, first of all, that religions simply cannot avoid to position themselves towards other interpretations of normative questions regarding truth and values, both within the own pluralistic traditions and with regard to the competing religious and secular worldviews. This does not mean we assume that they are necessarily incapable of dealing with diversity, since conflicts do not need to be qualified as principally negative. Rather, they should be perceived and they're ambivalent, potentially destructive, but also potentially creative or integrative functions. In religious pluralistic constellations, this is our second assumption, the sheer existence of the other, the different other, forces religious traditions to position themselves in the sense of a representation or affirmation of their own self-understanding. Religious positioning in our discussions is a theoretical concept that tries to analyze the philosophical, epistemic, aesthetical and ethical aspects, as well as the communicative, historical, social and political conditions for a dialogical practice of dealing with religious difference and conflict. It implies a dialogical understanding of positioning, which considers the possibility of an acknowledgement of persistent, maybe in irresolvable plurality and difference, thus arguing in favor of a communicative practice that clearly voices one's own position without failing to acknowledge the position of the other. And Roy Menbassad was convinced that tolerance, the contested term that we have chosen for this symposium could be helpful if understood along the lines of what the Frankfurt scholar Rainer Forst has termed a critical theory of tolerance. It understands tolerance not as much as paternalistic toleration, but as the interplay of firm conviction, capability of self-reflection and respect for the other, thus enabling to explore and negotiate the limits of mutual understanding. And Rui was indeed particularly interested in philosophical and political questions regarding tolerance and intolerance. He strongly contributed to the Jewish studies element of the overall project that is devoted to an analysis of debates on pluralism in modern Jewish philosophies, both with regard to inner Jewish plurality and to the relation to other religious traditions. His own project was entitled 
tolerance and intolerance in the dialogues and debates between differing Jewish positions in the Israeli context. As a philosopher, he was particularly interested in the religious and philosophical principles underlying the positions of religiously liberal, orthodox, Haredi or secular voices in those debates. He had immersed himself in the religious, ethical, cultural and philosophical uh, debates and positions represented among others by Shmuel Hugo Bergman, Yeshayahu Leibovitz, Rav Kook. And his endeavor was to study the religious and intellectual roots of these diverse voices within the context of crucial historical developments of the 20th century, the two world wars, the Shoah, the establishment of the state of Israel and the conflicts in the Middle East and within Israeli society. How did he asked Jews thought respond to the spiritual, intellectual and social challenges involved in these historical events? Which answers can philosophical perspectives provide to the politically charged religious tensions between differing perceptions and interpretations of those challenges? Which potential for tolerance or intolerance is inherent in the polyphonous positions of the representatives of differing currents within Jewish thought? However, it was not just about historical reconstructing and understanding these positions, nor about describing their philosophical assumptions and implications. Roy Ben Basad was genuinely interested in the political reality in which these religious and intellectual dialogues and debates unfolded. He passionately wanted to contribute to developing religiously and politically relevant models of tolerance and mutually respectful debates within Israeli society and in general. It is because of this that we chose the topic for this symposium, which is devoted to his memory. Tolerance and intolerance in Israel, Palestine, religion, plurality and difference. And I would most warmly thank my friend and colleague Kamar ben Yohanan, professor at the Humboldt University in Berlin for co-organizing the symposium with me. She will share her memories and her thoughts about Oi's work in her following introductory remarks. And I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to the speakers of this event, Menachem Loberbaum, Erika Weiss, Nitzan Libovitz, and Mirav Jones for graciously agreeing to speak to us today. I'm convinced that Roy Ben Bassad would have loved to be here, to engage in discussion with these distinguished scholars and with all of us today. And I know that his voice would have mattered. We are missing his voice and his presence, not merely today, but constantly. These are of course emotions that are difficult to express, but let me conclude by saying that for us, OE will be present during the symposium and beyond. A companion in our thoughts and discussions and also in our hearts in Frankfurt. So he will not be forgotten. And as a symbolic expression of this presence in our heart, please let us take a few moments to listen to one of his songs entitled, Into Your Craft. <laughs> 
after this moment of remembering by listening to the music, uh, it is now uh, time for Kama Yohanan's remarks. Thank you very much, Christian. I also didn't know that he or he was a musician and it's so amazing to find this out now. And this person is so, I mean, endlessly creative and with just a, such a sense for beauty that shows in everything that he had done. And so I'm grateful for this aspect of his work as well, of, of who he is, who he was as well. So um, I, I wanna share a few memories that I have of Roe from a very different time in, in, in life. Um, the last time I met Roe was more than 10 years ago uh, when we were both students in Tel Aviv University. And uh, we shared a couple of courses together. The first time we met was in a seminar. Uh, it was a seminar about uh, self-knowledge and God's knowledge under the guidance of Professor Itamar Greenwald and Shlomo Biedermann in the program for comparative religion. Uh, we were brought together in this seminar by Kierkegaard's fear and trembling. Now that I come to think of it, the idea that this specific text, uh, which is in a sense the epitome of loneliness and of what could not be understood by another can indeed bring people together is precisely in the heart of what is uh, of, of what is intellectual work. As I mentioned, it was a very early and incohate state in my own academic life and my first encounter with Kierkegaard and with the academic studies of religion in general. And Roy sent me his paper uh, on, Kierkegaard, on Kierkegaard's concept of irony in preparation for my presentation in the seminar. And uh, um, uh, um, this paper was later integrated into his very brilliant dissertation titled The Relation Between the Philosophical and the Religious, Reconsidering Kierkegaard's Confrontation with Philosophy. And I remember that this paper was formative for me. It was formative both because of the content, the paradoxical and sharp tensions which were depicted between religion and philosophy that are at the same time essential and internal to both realms or to both disciplines. Um, this became also central to the way I came to see religious thought to this very day. But no less important than the content, it was also the first time I read an academic paper that was written so beautifully which the scientific formulation did not prevent it from being so aesthetic, even moving. On the contrary, the lucidity and the sharpness of Roy's argumentation, combined with a Kierkegaardian passion, were merged together into an almost poetical third quenching, a thirst quenching piece. It was one of the first moments in which I knew what I wanted to do in the academia and in my intellectual life in general. So this reading of Roy's existential reading of Kierkegaard's existentialism was existential for me as well. After this short friendship in Tel Aviv, in the Gilman Building of Humanities, uh, to be more precise, our paths parted for many years. It was only a couple of years ago that I learned that in fact, we were carried in similar scholarly routes and continued to be occupied by closely related questions. Or he remained with Kierkegaard, talking, uh, taking uh, his existentialism into the realm of the interreligious and revealing his influences on contemporary Jewish thinkers. This was done even with these Jewish, when these Jewish thinkers were reluctant to admit Kierkegaard's uh, impact on their thought, as in the case of Yeshayahu Leibovitch. Notwithstanding, Leibovitch was, as is well known, a resilient critique of Christianity, where he was able to expose hidden uh, dialogical interreligious subtexts in Leibovitch's thought um, and revealing a strong dimension of interreligious intertextuality infused in Leibovitch's entire oeuvre, showing how the conversation between different religions at times take place beneath the surface, almost unwillingly from the side of the author, and how these two authors can meet precisely in the point where they both uh, work on the particularity and the singularity of their religions, a point that on the surface allows no encounter at all. In Roy's words, both Kierkegaard and Leibovitch present a remarkable example of exclusive religious position, which defies the universal claims of reason since the enlightenment and also opposes itself to other religious forms. Whereas Leibovitch opposes to the Haskalah movement, 
on the one hand and to Hasidic and Kabbalistic Jewish currents on the other, Kierkegaard rejects the attempt to reduce Christianity into a universalistic moral epistemic doctrine on the one hand and the contemporary institutional form of Christianity on the other. This type of religious particularism may be the most repelling, for, uh, repelling from the perspective of our interest in tolerance, dialogue and pluralism, yet it might also be the most conceptually well-founded and resilient to humanistic criticism. Thus the intertextuality between Leibovic and Kierkegaard supported Roy's unique approach to the interplay between tolerance and intolerance in religion. Roy's work challenges our assumptions, um, uh, our assumption that it is precisely the universal, the ethical realm that allows us to open a space for dialogue and conversation based on the common ground of reason, while the particular, the existential and the subjective aspects of faith remain intimate and exclusive and exclude such dialogue. Roy's work subverted under the obviousness in which we define the parts of religion which promote tolerance and those which promote intolerance. Is it possible that precisely Kierkegaard's overcoming of the universal realm of ethics could serve not as a rejection of a dialogue with another religion, but precisely as its intellectual and existential basis? Or to put it differently, in paraphrasing again Roy's words, is it possible that precisely the particularistic religious positions could do better in this setting than self-consciously tolerant religious positions, which directly attempt to reconcile the concepts and the values of their respective religious frameworks with philosophical reasoning and universal values. This deconstruction of the universal as the focal point for the interreligious encounter directly confronts the main intellectual challenges of our time. And the resonating doubts many scholars now have whether the universal secular ethical perspective indeed suits as the paradigmatic structure on which to build a society characterized by a deep diversity and a plurality of religious convictions. I wrote to Roy in the summer before the last, um, as I learned that he was in Germany and I was on my way here too. And I was very much hoping to have the chance to renew our friendship and also to tell him how much of an inspiration he uh, was for me back then. I was deeply sorry to find out that this chance uh, was lost. It is unbelievably sad that we can not know how his own thought would have evolved and what kinds of answers he would have provided to these questions. But his questions, the work he already published and the interdisciplinary way in which he approached his work, combining philosophy, political science, religion, and Jewish studies together continue to inspire both me and many, many others and remain as existential as always. In this symposium, we tried to bring something of these questions and especially of the unexpected ways in which we explored them by bringing together a very original and interdisciplinary group of scholars from philosophy, literature, sociology, and political science who are occupied with similar issues. And with this note, uh, I would like to welcome our first speaker, Professor Menachem Lorgo Boim. Uh, we're very happy uh, that you're here with us. Um, and very grateful for you to uh, accept our invitation. So I will introduce Menachem now. Menachem, Menachem Lorgo Boim is Vice Dean of Humanities and Professor of Jewish Philosophy at Tel Aviv University. He's also a founding member of the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. Um, Menachem's scholarship focuses on the formation of political and religious discourses and the interactions between them. Central to his work has been the effort to create a new political language for modern day Jewish polity. Among his many publications, Menachem is the author of Politics and the Limits of the Law. Um, uh, we are dazzled by his beauty and one of the senior editors of the Jewish political tradition series. His forthcoming book, Before Hasidism, is a study of Hasidism as a model of Jewish religious revitalization in early modernity. And uh, Menachem's uh, title for today's uh, talk is Tolerance and Unresolvable Virtue. Menachem, please. Thank you. Thank you, Karma. Thank you, Christian. Thank you very much for inviting me um, to this um, um, sad and yet wonderful occasion. It's, it's um, and I want to um, also um, uh, express uh, 
how moved I am that the Ben Basat family is here and, um, and what a worthy way of, um, of placing, of placing Roy's memory before us all. I speak to you now, I'm sitting in En Karim in near Jerusalem um, and um, daily when I wake up here, I, I always think of John the Baptist um, wandering through these valleys here. I think about the Palestinian families that are no longer here um, and, um, and the reality of our life in these Judean hills, which are um, in many ways um, foundational. These wanderings are foundational to the very meaning of religion in the West. And speaking from here, I'm thinking about, about toleration um, of what I think ought to be an overcoming of, of a degrading of toleration as, as a virtue. Um, and what I'd like to do in my few remarks would be, first of all, to explain why I think toleration was, although a crucial idea in developing modern um, notions of living, of living together in difference in modernity, uh, why it was demoted from its status um, for making place for other, um, for other notions, for other concepts, um, and, and then try to give some thoughts about how we might reappropriate toleration as, as a crucial tool, um, a crucial implement in our toolbox when, when thinking about our political lives or what's left of them, um, uh, what will be left of them after, um, hopefully after uh, um, um, this pandemic will, will be behind us. So let me begin by saying that the, the classic treatises on toleration are 17th century and early 18th century um, um, works. Uh, most notably, I, I'll mention John Locke's letters concerning toleration. And um, the letters concerning toleration have a very important place in Locke's oeuvre generally because um, uh, one of the crucial questions that we can ask about John Locke is um, why did, uh, why did Locke um, um, not adopt the position of both Spinoza and of Hobbes before him about uh, regarding um, sovereign supremacy with regard to religion? Um, Locke himself never really gave a frontal answer to this in his, um, in his writings on government. But the answer is in the letter concerning toleration. And the letter, con the, uh, uh, um, the letter concerning toleration is crucial um, in the history of the modern polities because basically it's in that letter that Locke spells out a formula that will be crucial to the relation between religion and state up to this very day. And that, and, and, and that formula is that to the degree that religions are willing to relinquish the claim to government, secular government, can make space for religion in the polity. This is, this is the political heart of the letters concerning toleration and explains its ongoing significance. But the other element in, the, in, in Locke's letters is that of, of uh, presenting an analysis of toleration and a grounding in, if we use Kantian language, a grounding of toleration. Um, and um, before I get into the, the precise argument, I want to say something about what I call the degrading of toleration. Because what happens um, not even 100 years after, uh, um, after Locke's uh, uh, letter is that the central concept for thinking politics in the, um, in the new republics and most importantly, in the revolutionary republics of uh, republics of the end of the 18th century, um, are um, is the concept of liberty, of freedom, 
Um, the concept of freedom brings along with it as an attendant concept, a concept of rights. Um, a right-based politics is a very, is, it has very strong claims. Um, how do rights operate? Rights operate by designating or carving out a space for individuals that's inviolable in social space. When you have a strong concept of rights, it seems, at least prima facie, that you don't need a concept of toleration because the whole idea is that the state undertakes a promotion of these rights and a defense of these rights, whatever the inventory of these rights will be. Um, and under such conditions, one doesn't need to be tolerated. One has to claim one's rights in order to posture oneself in civic space. This is, this is the great movement, the great move made by Enlightenment politics. Um, uh, um, leaving toleration behind, its toleration was understood as a whim of the tolerating towards the person tolerated. Um, and the concept of rights is a much stronger position. Ultimately, the concept of rights is, uh, um, is based upon a strong concept of liberty. And to that respect, in that respect, I would claim at least when we look at people like Rousseau or people like, um, or someone like Kant, um, um, but I think it's true also of Hegel, um, uh, we um, basically, liberty is for them a metaphysical concept. It's part of what it means to be a human being. To be a human being is to be free in a very strong sense. In that way, in that sense, um, enlightenment politics is, is grounded in a, in a metaphysical understanding of what we are as human beings. Um, I think that this is also its weakness. But, uh, um, but it's certainly the strong claim that's, that, that's made by it and one that's foundational in many polities. It's certainly uh, part of what stands behind the opening um, statement of the US Constitution. Um, we take these truths to be, um, to be self-evident. Um, and um, a, as a footnote, I'll say, I, th I think one of the things that, 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 that also show how, to what degree modern politics and their deep belief in, um, in institutional uh, constitutionalism, um, how much it's weakened is that, that the United States of America has had for four years a president that is not committed to its constitution. Um, I think this is something we have not seen before um, and, um, and, and one that's truly very frightening in many different ways. Now, I think one of the elements that, um, that, have, um, that have characterized 20th century politics is different from, from uh, early 19th century, I, I would rather, rather than calling it 19th century politics, I would call it the 19th century aspiration for what um, what, what good politics ought to be. Um, when we turn to the 20th century, I think that one of the things that we can see is um, a rise of the importance of pluralism in many different um, um, uh, democracies. One of the reasons for this is that is uh, here again, we can turn to the United States where the concept of pluralism is created. It's part of, um, of the recreation of the United States following the Civil War in a way that will enable to turn it into an immigrant society. An immigrant society is one that has to learn to live with difference. Um, and, and I think that one of the first experiences of, of the challenge of the immigrant society in the United States, and then one that, will, that, uh, one that it continues to haunt the United States, as indeed many immigrant societies, is that by, um, by, the, uh, um, by the current natives, it doesn't matter who they are, they can be white Americans, white, uh, uh, the current natives always see immigrants as someone who is not worthy of that status of liberty. Um, um, 
the, the, the regarding the other, the immigrant, uh, uh, dehumanizing the immigrant in a very specific sense, that is, of, um, of not being uh, worthy of a status of liberty is a, um, is a challenge that has to be overcome by every, by every immigrant society. Um, of the way the first wave of immigrants treats the next wave coming after it in line. Um, Michael Walzer always used to beautifully say that every national movement is tested by the, sp by the space it, it, um, it creates for the next one in line. And I think it's true also about waves of immigration to every society. Um, uh, every wave is tested by the space it'll create and the legitimacy it will grant to that, to the, to the, um, to that coming in line. Um, I think in this respect of this test, I think my own polity, the state of Israel, has, has failed dismally with regard to, uh, uh, and ironically, with regard to those that were here before them, the Palestinians. Um, and, uh, um, and this is something that, 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 that the mode of thinking about this is, is in my opinion, part, of, part and parcel of, uh, of the ability to, to create a moral polity. Um, um, here in, in the Holy Land. Now, um, pluralism is, is a different kind of notion um, than, uh, um, than, uh, um, than both liberty, but also toleration. Um, pluralism makes an interesting epistemic claim, and here I'll speak not about a skeptical concept of pluralism, which is definitely possible, but rather the more robust form of pluralism, for example, the one that was classically presented by Isaiah Berlin, which is, saying, which is to say that the fundamental plurality of values in our lives cannot be overcome. Um, um, there's no one answer to the relationship between justice and the good. Um, or justice in the good and the sacred for those for whom the sacred is crucial. Um, uh, we have many different kinds of values. And, and this epistemic uh, point of departure is one that is, uh, um, uh, um, creates a very certain frame of mind. But what's important for our discussion is that when you come to the discussion with notions, with the concept of liberty, and or a concept of pluralism, both of these um, highlight that toleration is, um, is a weak political virtue. Um, and that's the way it has been classically treated um, in, um, in, in most Western political thinking, to the best of my knowledge. There have been attempts, as Christian beautifully said before also, to rethink toleration. And I think that we have to join them because uh, um, uh, um, in um, the present condition of the polities in which we live, um, we, um, I believe we have to uh, recall um, um, this notion primarily uh, uh, the notion of toleration as a, um, excuse me, as, a, 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 um, as part of our, our understanding of the primacy of the ethical. Let me explain. Why is toleration a complex um, um, value? Because what toleration calls for is a very complex posture. It means recognizing Usually, the claim for toleration comes from uh, towards a person who claims to know what the truth is. If you don't know what the truth is, if you're skeptical with regard to the truth or to the good, or you're a pluralist, you don't have this challenge. But if you have a strong position on the good and a strong position on the truth, and you're faced with someone who you believe is wrong, but is committed to their position. What do you do? Toleration calls for us not to act upon our beliefs. It's a second order virtue. It's one that puts a break on our 
um, on our intuitive primary uh, tendency. Our intuitive primary, primary tendency is to follow our concept of truth. Toleration calls us to put a break on our movements and to accept the other, even though we believe he or she are wrong. Um, I think that that uh, um, um, for most, for many people who don't experience a um, um, a chance for toleration in their civic life, um, their parental life will be um, an important eye opener. I think one of the things we learn very quickly that our children teach us is that although we are convinced that they are wrong in their choices, we have to take a back seat. Um, um, toleration is that kind of virtue. It's a second order virtue. We're sure we know what, what is right, but we are called to put a break on ourselves. This is both the strength, this is, I would say, it's, it, this is the weakness of toleration on the one hand, vis-a-vis uh, -vis other claims such as liberty or, um, or pluralism, but it's also its strength because it's primarily has to do with an ethical posturing. And here I join Kant, not with the notion of the primacy of morality, but I would call it the primacy of the ethical. And that is that the primacy of ethical calls us to adopt toleration as a crucial disposition within um, our civic standing. But I want to take this a step forward, and with this, with this, with this step forward, I'll also end my presentation. What is the step forward? That is the question of, of what would a theology of toleration look like? How would we cultivate such a move? Now, uh, Locke has his own way of going about it. Locke's famed argument in the letter concerning toleration is that we don't choose our beliefs. Our fundamental faith is something that overcomes us. It's not, it's not something we choose. And therefore, a faithful person is worthy of being tolerated. Um, I think that this is a very weak presentation of, of, what, um, of what religious commitment is about. And if one thinks that way, then, uh, uh, then an alternative concept of revelation is what is needed and not, uh, not a uh, fideistic notion of uh, faith as, as Locke goes about doing it. And let me spell this out just in a few words. Um, for myself, uh, toleration is part and parcel of a certain vision of wisdom, Sophia in Greek of chokhmah in, in, in Hebrew. It is an ethical, position that comes from a reflective posturing. Um, um, in that respect, that second order quality that I spoke about is actually indicative of a, um, uh, of a deeper stance in life. I apologize if you hear my dogs barking, somebody rang the bell outside. They have to be tolerated, for example. <laughs> Um, and when you look at toleration from the, from the prism of wisdom, one can ask the following question. Does revelation necessarily obliterate wisdom? Um, or, as I would suggest, revelation has a chance of adding a depth dimension to wisdom, of insight, of presence. Revelation is not a trump card. Revelation is an opening of being with a renewed appreciation of what reality, of what Wirklichkeit is. To the degree that revelation is an ennobling moment, it makes wisdom not only a possibility, but a profound possibility in the good life. Um, I think it's sketching this possibility that we have to promote, that I would suggest we promote. And this is the reason 
to return to toleration as part of the ethical training of a wise person and of good life. Thank you very much. Christian, do you want to run this or Kalma or should I? Yes, I'm sorry. I thought you were listening to me all the time. No, I didn't hear you. So, yeah, I was muted. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Thank you very much, Menachem, for the conceptual framework and, and for your suggestions. And um, I thought that it's uh, maybe it's time to open the discussion and ask whether people want to, to ask a few questions. And I already saw that some of you raised their hands. Uh, if you can also maybe write in the chat that you're interested in asking a question, and then uh, we will ask you to speak, to unmute yourselves, or we will unmute you and you could speak. Stefan, I think, okay. Stefan, I think nobody can hear you. Can you also unmute yourself? I can't hear Stefan. Does anybody hear me now? Oh, yes. yes. Okay, so I always have to switch between the two microphones for some reason. I have one um, uh, uh, raised hand already, Erica Weiss, please. Thank you. Uh, I just had a, a question about the uh, the applicability of your insights. Um, yeah. For example, uh, you, you said at one point, uh, this is not for pluralists. They already have this um, attitude, like if, you're, if you don't believe in an absolute truth. But, but I wonder if that is actually a position that you think exists. And I would suggest that uh, people who consider themselves pluralist are often in many ways uh, very intolerant uh, when it comes to their own many times liberal boundaries of, you know, intolerant others and, and, and whether this is not just absolutely applicable to, to everybody. Um, Erica, of course, I, I, I agree with you completely. I think pluralists just describe themselves otherwise. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. So I, I exactly. would most definitely, <laughs> yeah, the, the difference between the way people describe themselves and what they are is, is something that we all know, uh, you know, um, it's, uh, uh, I think my own definition of the saintly person is, is the person that in real time is actually, um, is actually um, transparent to, to his motives. Actually what? Transparent to his motives. So maybe I can follow up on this question. Sure, come Okay, great. So what you mean now from your uh, short dialogue with Erika, uh, I understand that uh, you see toleration in itself as part of the, let's say the, the doctrinal or the, or, or the faith system that needs to be tolerated, right? So what exactly is the difference between, and also when you gave this, this very nice example about parenthood, uh, there is something very strong about this idea that we need to tolerate and in a sense it's it's already part of our set of, of beliefs well you know uh, i think kalma uh, the, the weakness of you understand the other positions when you can also pinpoint the weakness of toleration the weakness of toleration is that it depends on the subject tolerating um and it's precisely that that uh, um, thinkers who promoted both the concept of rights and concepts of pluralism, they wanted to overcome that uh, um, because you cannot claim toleration from another. It's bestowed upon you. That's the structure of toleration, at least in its classic form. And therefore, what, <clears throat> what, what, uh, uh, that's why, Restructuring the notion of toleration 
in terms of an ethical posture is one that I hope would attenuate this subjective weakness because it, it becomes then part of, of what it is that we are, um, that we are uh, uh, um, expecting in a meeting with otherness. Um, and it doesn't, in, it doesn't ne necessitate the kind of obliterating of the subject that you will find in someone like Levinas, where, where encountering the other is, is an overcoming of the self. Uh, um, um, I think that, I think that, that Levinas's ethics has, has two great prices to pay for, for making that move. But I do think that, uh, um, that an adequate posturing of toleration, um, the way I'm suggesting it, it, it can be uh, uh, um, put forth as part of the condition for, um, for, uh, um, for true dialogue. Um, and in a way that I think that, that, that is more robust than the, the, the way Buber goes about constructing the I-thou relationship. Thank you very much. Litsa will be next on my list. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, it's a pleasure seeing you all, uh, people I missed for, for a long time, uh, in spite of the circumstances here. Um, as a father to teenagers, I can say that my tolerance now needs to be at its strongest position. Uh, <laughs> not, not a weak one uh, for now. Uh, but I wanted Menachem maybe to push a little on, on both sides as a historian rather than a philosopher, you know, to ask you, uh, to say something about the, the transformation from the weak into the strong position, right? Which we are talking in historical terms uh, as a, I don't know, more or less uh, um, uh, a flow or a continuity, form of continuity between tolerance, which is we usually take back to the 17th century as you started and the pluralistic intercultural Etc. transnational positions we have in the later uh, centuries. So if you can say something about the link and uh, from the other end of it, of it uh, to say something about actually where, the, the, where tolerance uh, does stand in front of a certain, uh, as a Grenzbegriff, if you like, and that is of course the, the, you know, the, the position even with John Locke, even with the one who actually uh, grounds the, the individual position of, of tolerance, uh, the, the, the limit of it is, of course, vis-a-vis -vis atheism, right? So atheism is, is what we would, in, in Locke's eyes, is something we would see nowadays as, as a form of nihilism or the negation of all, right? Which is where tolerance ends. If you can say something about that, you know, continuity on the one hand and kind of where that ends uh, on the other. This is, this is, this is an excellent question, Nitsan. This, um, and of course, this is, this is what we have to do. I think that uh, what I'd like to say in response um, is not to give a full answer, but at least to say that that um, um, uh, um, one of the prerequisites, I, I think that that make toleration such an interesting virtue, is that in order to tolerate, you have to see. You can't tolerate what you're not seeing. Okay, so in that respect, um, um, if, if there's a case for toleration, we're already speaking about something being visualized. Now, I, I, uh, uh, I think one, one of the greatest problems, of, for example, of, of, of Israeli society, but of also, I think of, of what I spoke about waves of immigration, is the refusal to see otherness. Now, when you, when you look at Locke, I think that that Locke, uh, um, one of the, the great weakness of the um, of the letter concerning toleration uh, in terms of its future, although I can understand its politics, was the argument why why toleration um, uh, um, can't be given. I don't think atheism was a real problem for him. I think atheism in, in uh, up to Locke still is really a bad name that's used for those that are, that that you don't agree with. But Catholics and Jews are very real for uh, um, in, in the letter concerning toleration, and they are not worthy of being tolerated. 
Um, um, and and this this is amazing because because basically what he's doing is is explaining to us why um, they're not to be seen. Um, we we don't have to take them into account in this account because they because they, they their otherness is understood as an enemy. Um, so that's that's uh, um, I, I I think that 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 here uh, um, 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 because the uh, the encountering of otherness in many of our societies is so palpable. Um, even to, uh, I think that toleration is, and uh, the uh, um, raising toleration into an ennobling virtue is one of the crucial strategies for overcoming hatred as a dominating passion in our politics. That's why I connected it with wisdom, because it's, you know, it, 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 the, the passion of hatred vis-a-vis -vis the others in the public space is akin to the passion of anger with regard to our children. We love our children, but they drive us crazy. Um, well, as do our parents and, our, and as we did to our parents when we were younger. This also we have to remember. So, um, so I think that, uh, uh, um, and, and in all this, of course, I'm being very Aristotelian because um, um, uh, I think that it's precisely the adequate work with the passions, which is what gives a depth dimension to our to our ethical stance. Um, that's why I also part with Kant. That's why I'm speaking about the primacy of the ethical and not the primacy of the moralitat. To use um, to, 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 to use the German, so um, uh, so this is this is the the Gestalt from which I'm speaking. Next would be Rida. Uh, yes, thank you very much for your lecture. Um, I was wondering uh, after uh, the question of uh, Erika um, about how you've described tolerance as a virtue. I was wondering, um, would you agree that maybe virtue is a misleading word for it? Because if you, like I have understood, as I understood it, that on the one hand, it depends on the subject tolerated, but on the other hand, um, tolerance, uh, because you overlook it yourself, like pluralists can be intolerant, and not recognize it. Uh, tolerance is something that goes against our natural instincts. Like it's not an instinct, it's something that has to be trained. Um, and therefore, wouldn't it be easier if you call it a, tr a skill or a competence rather than a virtue? Um, no, I, 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 I thank you, Rida, for that question. It's, it's, it's an excellent question. And um, um, I would insist on the virtue for precisely the, the, um, uh, um, the kind of Aristotelian traditional um, uh, conceptions. Um, it, uh, um, a skill is, is uh, um, uh, um, a, uh, um, it, it is more akin to, um, uh, let, let's turn it into the Greek, into a techne. Um, um, that's that's something very different. Although I do believe that we have certain psychological skills um, th that we can acquire, but it's precisely I th I think what 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 the reason we we can treat toleration as a virtue is because it entails a certain kind of overcoming. Of, 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 of an inner, um, uh, of a primary disposition. It needs a restructuring of a disposition. And, and in that respect, it, it's ethical in the sense that it's part of creating a, a character, in this sense, a civic character or even a religious character, depending on, 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 on what kind of elements we want to bring into it. Um, the, if you take it, the concept of revelation, what's, what was standing behind the notion of revelation that I suggested is, is a very Wittgensteinian one of an aspect dawning. And if you add this kind of aspect dawning to, uh, um, uh, um, to, uh, to your thinking, it becomes a, um, a way 
of being in the world that we're talking about, but it's an ethical being in the world because it has to do with, with an attuning of, of, of character. So it's, it's this combination that, that, that I'm kind of seeking after. And therefore, I, I, I think that this is a virtue. I think it's a proper civic and religious virtue. one on the list right now. Um, maybe I'll add on one point. I think, Rita, it, the question is always there open because the, the, the concept of virtue returns to the Greek arete, which is an excellence. And, and therefore, it's already the question of how to, how to distinguish between arete and a techni, with what we're talking about, a psychological uh, uh, quality really returns to the very foundations of this ethical tradition. So I think I think the question is perfect. Yes, thank you so much, Menachem, for your fascinating talk. Uh, since you mentioned Buber, I would like to ask something. Um, I have discussed the potential of. Uh, Jewish philosophy, especially early 20th century Jewish philosophy for tolerance or dealing with the plurality with OE many times. And uh, he would probably have agreed with you saying that the, um, the theory of dialogical thinking in Martin Buber um, has its flaws or is not as relevant as it could be. Um, I was wondering whether if you look at Buber's more specific feelings uh, with dialogue partners in in debates, for example, he had with Christian theologians, whether there's not something else that is not maybe that clear in his dialogical philosophy, namely uh, that he's saying that even though there may be total disagreement in religious terms, um, there's something that, um, that uh, is a joint or should be a joint persuasion of, of Christianity and Judaism, and that's it, uh, the concept of epistemic humility. And that if you encounter the other, um, it is about perceiving a perception, as you said, uh, but it's also about acknowledging the essential right of the other to be completely different and completely um, contesting your own views, and that you should acknowledge uh, the, the dignity of this position without giving up your own position. Um, and I was wondering whether from your point of view, that's a different dimension of his thought or whether that also is something that you would subsume under his uh, theological philosophy in I am thou. Yeah. Uh, Christian, thank you for your question. And I wanna, I, uh, um, I wanna clarify that I, the way I understand my position as a developing of, of Buber, not as an alternative. Um, um, I think it's, it's uh, um, I think, Buber opened a, a crucial path for us. Um, on, on the revelatory side, um, my own argument is that every theology is necessarily comparative. Um, it's inescapable for precisely the reason you said why, because we all approach God, whatever, whatever particular religious language we have, we approach God from a shared world. And, um, and therefore, our point of departure is necessarily very close. So, so we're already beginning with, with a fundamental premise of, of placing, of placing uh, a revelation in the world or, or an expectation from the divine that we share. So in that respect, I think that, that, that uh, um, we must adopt um, uh, a kind of dialogical uh, um, thinking as part and parcel of theological reflection. Um, uh, that, that, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is that um, a, a commitment to dialogue means, and I think that this is what Menachem Fish and Itzik Ben Baji taught us in their, in their great work, it means that uh, um, we need we need a partner to mirror uh, to us the place from which we are speaking. We can never look at ourselves otherwise. Um, there's no way that we have that kind of, of knowledge, of self-knowledge. Um, that placing is, is, is so fundamental to us. And therefore, um, and I think here, Buber is, is a pathbreaker. 
<clears throat> and we have to work with him. This is one of the reasons. And here uh, I join, you know, Derrida was very much aware of this in his critique of, um, of Levinas, that, that uh, Levinas peer, uh, uh, um, paid a very great price in terms of dialogue um, for his moves. Um, and so I agree completely, Christian. I would not like to be understood as posing an alternative to um, to um, to Buber, but asking how um, what would be the adequate theological and ethical, not a, both underpinnings and consequences of adopting a um, a robust dialogical position. Thank you. That's extremely helpful to understanding this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Menachem. Uh, this was very, very fascinating. And um, and I think it will be very interesting to also to pose because then our next speaker is a sociologist, of course. So we're going uh, from this uh, uh, theological philosophical uh, uh, discussion of the involvement of the idea of, of toleration to the sociological perspective on the idea of, of peace. And uh, I'm very uh, excited to uh, invite or to present uh, uh, Dr. Erika Weiss, um, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Tel Aviv University. And she has been carrying out research on non-liberal religious approaches to pluralism and democracy for more than seven years. She has published a book on her dissertation uh, uh, research entitled uh, Conscientious Objectors in Israel, Sacrifice Citizenship, Trials of Fealty. And uh, every time uh, I hear you, Erika, it's always very fascinating. And uh, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Please, you can begin. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real opportunity. Uh, I, I'm very grateful for the opportunity also to uh, learn about Ruiz's work that I, that I wasn't familiar with before and I have found fascinating and also to expand my disciplinary horizons to meet these other scholars who are interested in the same topic. Uh, it's actually even worse than you thought. I'm actually an anthropologist, <laughs> even worse than uh, you imagined. Uh, <laughs> Um, but it, nevertheless, <laughs> uh, I want to share uh, some of my recent work with you and the kind of um, thoughts I've had and the things that I've been working on, these concepts of tolerance, of peace, of coexistence. Um, so I've been uh, doing this research. Basically, the trajectory of my interest uh, it follows kind of the, the decline, the, the kind of very well-known decline of the Israeli mainstream peace camp who had its heyday in the 1970s and, and uh, from the 70s until the 90s and kind of declined very, very sharply uh, uh, in the 2000s. And in the wake of this, the kind of emergence that uh, one can find of alternative peace initiatives of, pop, of groups that are simply way beyond the kind of normative borders of the, the peace camp. The peace camp is usually very secular. Um, left wing, um, pretty Ashkenazi as well. Uh, and I've kind of, I was always kind of, uh, not always, for, for even before I started this research, I had a few of these figures of, that I was very fascinated with on my horizon. And um, Rabbi Menachem Froman was always kind of just this very interesting figure. I think I knew the work of uh, Rabbi Sheolo uh, before I even started this research, but these kind of um, uh, groups that I've been working with of sometimes uh, Haredi Jews together with people from the Islamic movement that are working together to kind of uh, talk about what peace would mean to them, what tolerance would mean to them, what coexistence would mean to them. Um, and today I'm gonna a little bit focus more on a, a group I've been working with now for about three years, which is a group um, under the auspices of the Citizens Accord Forum, a group of uh, religious Zionists who have been working on these topics. And they were originally brought together. They're, they're, they're quite mainstream. Uh, if you compare them to some of the settler uh, groups that are, that are uh, like the Froman type that are, that are, that are uh, uh, not very mainstream. Um, and they were kind of brought together. And originally they asked them come up with a, a religious Zionist peace plan. And they uh, rejected that mandate. They said it was too big and the community was too diverse and, and it, it could never work. Uh, but instead, they're going to work on developing a religious Zionist lexicon on the topic of peace, a language on the topic of peace. And they have been working on this for a few years. 
And uh, I thought I would start uh, talking about this by telling you about an event, giving you an ethnographic scene <laughs> of um, uh, an event that they, they have been trying to uh, get in touch with decision makers uh, in Israel, internationally. And they were actually invited to the uh, embassy of the European Union to discuss with European diplomats their uh, understanding of peace and to kind of exchange views on the topic. Uh, so I want to tell you about uh, that interaction. <laughs> uh, and the, the scene I will, I will read and then I will speak freely again. For all the usual rhetoric against Europe and the international community prominent among my religious Zionist interlocutors, they were surprisingly eager to have the chance to finally explain themselves. I was attending a meeting at the embassy of the European Union in Tel Aviv between diplomatic representatives of several members of the EU and a group of Israeli religious Zionist peace, peace activists who had been conduct, conducting this uh, work for a number of years. Members of this group felt misunderstood and scapegoated by the mainstream left and by the international and especially by the European community. But understanding the political and symbolic importance of Europe, they were eager to set the record straight in front of these representatives as well as to challenge them on some points of principle that they did not agree with. It was my interlocutors who requested the meeting, not the European Union. There had been several meetings and phone calls in preparation for this encounter in which members of the group worked to articulate and fine tune their message. The EU representatives and those from my group would be allocated equal time to present their positions but my interlocutors were not particularly curious to hear what the European diplomats that had, uh, had to say. The idea behind the meeting was that if they could convince the European diplomats that their apparent intransience on certain issues was not politically motiv motivated, but rather a question of tradition and values that perhaps it would be a step towards greater European understanding and even sympathy. We had been bombarded with SMS WhatsApp messages from the group's leaders over the previous few days, requesting, demanding, and finally begging us to show up on time. Europeans, we were told, are extremely punctual and may take offense if we are tardy. Of course, this is quite funny, <laughs> but I think it all, it's also relevant. You know, these ideas, these very, as an anthropologist, these very uh, basic ideas of, of, of what's okay to do, whether it's okay to show up on time, whether it's okay to show up late, are connected to our, our ideas about what's fair about, about our, our, our moral regimes in general. So I think it's also part of it. But as a result, I and most of the group arrived before the European diplomats and I with them perused the pamphlets displayed in the hallway outside the conference room. Most were in English and tutored the European Union's humanitarian human rights and peace building initiatives in Israel and Palestine, as well as several uh, dedicated to the business and technological partnerships between Israel and the European Union. French Vice Ambassador began the meeting by presenting the standpoint of the European Union towards the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to explain, as he put it, where we come from. He stated that he thought much of the clash between the viewpoint of the European Union and that of Israelis is derived from the emphasis and values that Europeans place on international law and the rule of law, specifically the United Nations Security Council resolutions. They emphasize that there was already an agreement in place, the Oslo Accords, which my interlocutors hate with a passion, but I can get to that later. And from their perspective, this has a status of law. The other point that the vice ambassador returned to again and again and again was that the solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict must be universally applicable. And quote, a lot of people in Israel think that our European position on the conflict is cast in stone. And in fact, the bedrock of our position is very stable. The exemplary value of whichever solution that we will come to in this region for us European must be applicable everywhere. I think that it is important for everyone to understand that. I'm not speaking on my personal behalf. If you ask any decision maker in any European capital, he will tell you that we need to be consistent because if you accept certain things here, you will have to accept them elsewhere. I was talking before about international law. Of course, there are some times when you need to push for a solution to be imaginative and creative. 
But when you read the statement of the EU about the conflict, decision makers in Europe not only think about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, they also think about Crimea. And at this point, the, the woman from the group sitting next to me leaned over and said, what is Crimea? I'm not making fun of her, but I want to emphasize the difference in these kind of existence in the world. Uh, they also think about Venezuela. They also think about Russian accents, actions. And this is a little bit what I'm missing sometimes in my conversations here, and what is difficult to get across to a lot of people in Israel. Other diplomats spoke to various misunderstandings between Europeans and Israelis, including the support of European, Europeans for the concept of secular citizenship and human values. Then it was the religious Zionist turn to speak. Moti spoke first. He said, we are forced to contend with conflicting values, echoing a theme that had emerged very strongly from the internal meetings of this group. For every practicing Jew, it is difficult for him to separate between his identity as a Jew and as a citizen, between religion and the state, and this is not incidental. Almost everyone in Israel will say that peace is a value. The question is, when I say peace, what do I mean? When I say peace, from a religious perspective, when I talk about peace, I mean firstly the recognition that everyone is created in the image of God. Now, growing up in uh, Jerusalem before the Six Day War, I'm not one of these people that came from Europe, learning the Torah, learning about places in, in Judah and Samaria as kids, we couldn't get there because it was held by the Jordanians. But we used to go to places where we would try to see the Western Wall and to look out over these other sites in Samaria that we longed to visit. Now, these are two contradictory values. The Palestinians are created in the image of God, but I long to reach these sites. We need to get to some compromise between them. I'm eighth generation in Jerusalem for all that that implies. I didn't come from Europe. I'm not here trying to make some facile argument about the universalism of the European approach versus a particularism of the, of the uh, Jewish uh, religious approach. You can see in Modi's statements that there is a tension for him between a universalism, although it is a universalism embedded in his religious ideas about being created in the image of God, but uh, nevertheless, a, a tension between the universalism and a particularism of his longing to be in these places. One after another, the members of the group tried to explain what they found so difficult to accept about the vision of the European Union had laid out. There was a tone of defensiveness. One, made, one person made a few barbs about the age of European nations in comparison to the historic connection of the Jews in Israel. Rabbi Moshe, known as the jokester of the group, chided the diplomats. You know, you say that the European uh, position has been consistent all of, over all of the year, these years, and that is indeed true. But I am reminded that Einstein said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Several emphasized the traditionalism of the Israeli people and their attachment to their uh, religious resources of authority. They expressed their intense disdain for the Oslo Accords and their feeling that it did not offer them a livable solution to the conflict. The EU representatives uh, waited patiently, often looking somewhat distracted, some of them started chatting on the side and there was a little bit of a, a tense uh, confrontation about it. And, but my impression was that the diplomats saw the group as Israeli settlers more or less just making excuses for why they should not be asked to follow international law. Uh, after all, what they were hearing, religious justifications for being in the West Bank, a rejection of the legal status of Oslo was more or less what they had come to expect. When I cornered some of the diplomats after the meeting to ask their impressions, they said how important what it was for them to hear different segments of Israeli society, even those they didn't necessarily uh, agree with. Now, uh, one can uh, see this encounter as uh, the meeting of kind of a couple different trajectories coming together, okay? We can see that uh, the European diplomats, uh, uh, much like the many in the Israeli peace camp, are kind of seeped and, and embedded in, in this um, world of liberal internationalism, okay, which has its own history and its own trajectory and its own sense of, of right and wrong, okay, uh, based in the idea of international law, 
concept of legal universalism, okay, his emphasis on the, the idea that whatever contract, whatever legal implementation needs to happen in Israel, Palestine, it has to be applicable everywhere. This is from this perspective that we have to uh, have this one system that is applicable, uh, that we have a legal universalism, okay? Obviously, this is also related to, um, I think Kantian ideas of perpetual peace, but because I'm so ridiculously outgunned by philosophers here, I'm not even going to attempt to like uh, go into this kind of uh, analysis. Uh, I'm going to just put that out there and, and, and walk away. Um, but historically, I'll go historically, we can see that after World War I, right, after World War I, and we have this kind of devastation, we have this significant rise of this idea of uh, liberal internationalism, the creation of the League of Nations, and then uh, um, the the idea of an international community uh, evolving, that it, that the international community has a kind of stewardship. Okay, that's a very big word for this kind of attitude, a stewardship, a kind of tr a sacred trust of civilization to take care of these kinds of situations. Um, a very global perspective, an idea that there is an international system. Okay, and perhaps this is put on ice to some extent during the Cold War, but it reemerges very strongly with Clinton in, in the 90s. It reemerges uh, in his inter in the American international policy after the Cold War and, and comes back very significantly in the Oslo era. And we can see this kind of uh, thought process in what these uh, diplomats were saying. On the other hand, we have a group of religious Zionists who were never part of that world. Um, obviously, they're exposed to it. They've read about it. They're familiar with it. These are these are not uh, separate tribes by any means, but they're part of a very different project. Okay, they're part of a project uh, of religious Zionism, turning biblical interpretation, turning uh, certain parts of theology into concrete political instruction and realities. Um, I think that. Uh, uh, you know, when they're trying to develop this religious lexicon, when I say that their their goal is to um, to develop this lexicon to, to address this need, this is very much in step with the religious Zionist project, which is trying to modernize uh, 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 Judaism politically, in the sense that from their perspective, this is a return to sovereignty after two thousand years. Uh, and many things need to go through a process of translation, of modernization. And yes, absolutely, some of that does involve bringing in modern concepts and occasionally even liberal concepts. But the, the idea for this group was that their main ideas need to be kind of um, derived from a religious sources. So there is a lot, and this is also rather unique to the, the religious Zionist communities, particularly this one that uh, speaks uh, uh, at eye level, okay, discussing stories of the Bible, discussing these ideas in, in very free ways that are, allow very liberal political interpretation. Um, so uh, we have a kind of clash of these two groups. Of course, the, the religious Zionist group is on the one hand uh, pressed by this international community and the peace camp, but they're also pressed from the other side by a kind of more conservative um, and right-wing interpretation uh, local uh, in Israel, uh, specifically Rabbi Tao and uh, the Har Amol uh, school, if uh, to those who, who are familiar, are their kind of local nemesis on the other side. Um, so what, what can we learn from this? I think that um, which of these groups wants peace? What's the answer? I think the answer is to be found very significantly in the question that uh, Moti was asking, which was uh, almost, he said, uh, to remind you, he said, almost everyone in Israel says they want peace and that peace is a value. The question is, uh, what do they mean by that? Uh, and I think this is a very uh, significant uh, insight and an answer to a paradox that many in the mainstream peace camp uh, have been struggling with uh, for quite a while, um, which is a question of why do they say they want peace, but they, but they act differently. And I think the answer is this idea of visions of peace, of cultural understandings of peace, of different views of peace. And of course, uh, this, this, this can go quite in, in many directions, okay? And you can have a vision of peace that you absolutely don't accept. Um, 
when I suggest that everyone has a vision of peace and everyone wants peace, of course, that includes figures that would say that they want peace, maybe like a, a Rabbi Ginsburg figure who first requires more or less the transfer of Palestinians before he can envision peace. But, but it is a vision of peace. It is a vision of peace and, and, and informed by, by his idea of the good. It doesn't mean that we need to accept all of these visions, but if we accept that peace and tolerance and cultural uh, uh, coexistence is a culturally relative concept, um, we can not accept all of them, but at the same time, not all alternatives to the mainstream one or the liberal ones are necessarily repugnant, okay? Um, and looking at them and the claims that they offer, and this is very much my experience with the religious Zionist group, we can certainly see the ways in which a hegemonic uh, piece is problematic and inserts kind of imperialist pressure on uh, these other groups. When they're not conforming, it's assumed that they're not conforming for political right-wing reasons, and it doesn't give them the kind of space that they, that they need to develop other approaches. And so uh, I have a couple more minutes, right? Just a few more. Yes. Okay. Yes, you can even have if you need five, it's fine. Five. Okay, great, great. So then I will I will say just a few words about um, why they hate the Oslo Accords. <laughs> and why that's not necessary, why we can see that as an example of, um, you know, I think there's a perhaps not among this group, but if let's say speaking from the mainstream peace camp, this idea that anyone who hates the Oslo Accords hates the idea of peace or is against peace or is fighting peace. And what I'm trying to bring this as an example of how you can hate the Oslo Accords and still uh, not necessarily reflect on your, your feelings about, about peace. Um, so uh, at one of the meetings, uh, one of the leaders uh, was telling me about a conversation he had with one of the members and she said, uh, she, she said that, uh, you know, she really wanted to work with this group and it was really interesting for her to talk about the, the ideas of peace, but she's really, really frustrated with the ideas of peace. The word peace was just had such connotations for her because the left and the mainstream uh, um, peace camp in Israel had so dominated it. And for her, when they said peace, they mean Oslo. And so every time she heard the word peace, she heard Oslo and she couldn't get over it. Um, so at, at the beginning, I also didn't understand this, and I was asking one of the activists, Noam, why everyone was talking so disparagingly about the Oslo Accords. After all, I argued, they were all peace activists, and Oslo was a peace plan. He told me, I can't believe, I really cannot believe that a Jew negotiated the Oslo Accords. Really, really, I'm not joking with you. When you look at the Oslo Accords, it feels like it was written by someone with no connection to Judaism, to Israel, and no knowledge at all of this place or its traditions. It's like the agreement was written by someone from China or Japan or someone who heard that were two people fighting over this land and they decided to draw a line down the middle. It's the same for the Palestinians. An agreement that keeps Palestinians out of Jerusalem, far from Al-Aqsa, an agreement that doesn't let Jews go to Hebron and all the places in the Bible. He paused. The Oslo Accords have no uh, roots. And one refrain that I heard from religious Zionist camps and from Palestinians in the Islamic movement alike was the arbitrary distinction made between the two sides of the green line. Why is Yitzchak a settlement, but Ein Hod is not? Because they were settled 30 years apart? There's no difference between them, Khalid, an uh, activist from the southern branch of the Islamic movement told me. The religious Zionists would certainly agree. What are the problems with Oslo? They're neo-Wilsonian, they're part of this very uh, international, uh, liberal international uh, idea that is more oriented towards the international community uh, than it is towards Israel. Even one of the activists that I worked with said, it's like they forgot what's valuable. They traded gold for clay. Judah and Samaria, where Jewish history happened, now you can just, how can you just abandon that? Give them Tel Aviv, don't give away our history. It wasn't the idea of land for peace that was offensive to her. It was the failure to recognize and strategize with consideration to the highly differential worth of pieces, uh, different pieces of land in the religious imaginary. And as such, the decisions regarding state borders and particularly the restrictions on access uh, 
were threatening to those from the religious Zionist community in this group and made them feel extremely alienated from the leadership that had negotiated uh, these uh, points. The, the, another point is a question of authorizing values, okay? The Oslo Accords appeal to international law, which uh, they don't really care all that much about. <laughs> And one of the rabbis said, I wasn't impressed. I wasn't impressed by them. They keep talking about international law and UN resolutions, but they made those laws. They can pass new ones. You can't change halakha. You can't change religious Jewish law. And he was joking, right? It's a joke. He really is very well versed in these ideas, but he's making a point. He's using humor to make a point. And uh, when you look at the Oslo Accords, and I encourage you to read them again, there are only 188 pages. And um, there's near exclusive emphasis on matters of trade, state sovereignty, security. There is no reference made to God and very, very little attention paid to questions of religion, history, or tradition. Their attention to holy sites in general is about one page long and the pages about tax arrangements are, you know, just tens, tens, tens of pages. It's almost entirely an economic document. And um, so this would be an example of why uh, if we change our, our perspective and our framework, we can perhaps get a, crit uh, a critique from uh, unlikely uh, sources. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erika. And I'm sorry for missing, for saying that you are a sociologist, but clearly- It's, it's not there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I'm, I'm just thinking before I open the stage for, for, for questions, um, how would you define the, uh, toleration within anthropology, because clearly you really work with, with groups that sometimes really challenge exactly the, the mainstream of, of what should be and what should not be tolerated. So you don't have to answer that. It's just, a, um, just a, an idea. It's so, a huge question. It's a huge question, especially when working on, the, on these topics. Uh, I could talk about it a long time, but... Uh... <laughs> Okay, so but but I think uh, others should uh, probably want to ask. So um, the stage is open to questions. Please just write uh, in the uh, in the chat that you are interested in asking something. If there are no questions, we can go back to mine, but... Uh... <laughs> just, yeah. just Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Erika, for this very insightful talk. I, I learned a lot uh, and I felt reminded again to many discussions we had in our project, especially about uh, positions in religious Zionism or Haredi groups about, about plurality, about peace, about uh, tolerance. And um, since I'm not an anthropologist, but I'm looking at it from an intellectual history point of view or philosophy point of view, um, I was wondering whether the, the different positions that you describe between different groups within the religious Zionist movement and different visions of peace, whether they are all relying on the same religious basis or whether they also have a different, uh, different assumptions when it comes to the interpretation of of Jewish religion, um, because that's something that I, I mean, the, the group that you described is uh, probably not well known to many of us who are dealing with, uh, with uh, very um, general assumptions of which groups in, in Israel embrace which, uh, which um, positions. And it's fascinating to hear that, uh, and, and, and Roy Ben Basad was very aware of that, that it's very complicated and that, uh, that, that there are different positions. So is there a religious difference between the groups within the movement? I think that, that definitely. Um, I think that a lot of the, the fights over the politics take place through a religious uh, interpretation. So one example of that, that I, I just to bring one from the, the field work would be uh, the negotiations uh, uh, between this group and let's say, uh, members of more uh, right-wing uh, groups would be over a concept like a, a geotoshav, which is a kind of like resident alien 
uh, definition uh, that uh, has uh, religious roots, and there are many, there are a few references to it in, in religious texts. And the kind of fights are what does it mean in terms of people living in Israel that are not Jewish? Okay, so um, there are interpretations that suggest that people like this uh, should have almost uh, equal rights completely to to Jews and that if you if they're they're one of the populace they need to be treated the same they're they're different but they're the same a very very kind of um, equality uh, idea, idea of equality between them but you know then a kind of right more right-wing view will come in and say say, um, no, but actually there are these specific requirements on Gil Toshav that you're absolutely not going to uh, apply to these people. For example, they need to come before a religious rabbinical court and swear their allegiance to a Jewish sovereignty before they are able to get all these, all these rights. And there's no way you're actually going to do that. So how do you think you're going to imply, apply this concept? Um, so fights taking place through this, but it's, it's even more complicated by the fact that you know, no, no one in these groups wants to seem like the politics is what's driving their interpretation. Um, it's very important for them to, uh, you know, obviously these things get mixed up, but it's very important that, that, that it will at least seem, uh, and probably they sincerely want this as well, that, that, the, that the outcome is uh, the result of a kind of pure analysis of the religious texts and that will be applied, right? No one wants to say, oh, I'm a left winger. So I wanna, I wanna interpret this in the, in the left. And that's actually the, their major divide with the, this is not the first time people have appealed to people from this group, right? The, the, the mainstream peace camp has been trying to recruit people from religious communities for, for quite a long time. But the, one of the reasons that they were so resistant, at least in their, what the, they tell me to joining those kind of efforts was because those groups were so insistent that they just give uh, a left wing piece, uh, piece at all costs reading of biblical texts and just cherry pick um, religious texts to find the, the, the parts that support this kind of a, a peace Nick interpretation. And they want to do a more kind of authentic, deep, a rigorous analysis of the text and see what they really, really mean. So that the, the barbs traded between these groups are usually on the basis of, uh, no, you're, you're letting politics guide you. We're reading it like from both sides, right? There's the, the, right, the left, we're left, right? They're saying, no, you want to be right-wingers, but actually our, our texts demand this kind of, in, this authenticity. And the right-wingers are saying, no, you're leftists and you're just trying to read it that way. So those are the kind of back and forth uh, uh, barbs. And many times it does take place over these kind of uh, analysis of such concepts. Ida, just. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much. I've learned so much from your uh, speech. I was thinking, I was just wondering about, may maybe I, I missed it, I'm not sure, um, but uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the definition of peace, um, uh, how it's used. And I was thinking, I was somehow reminded of Martin Luther King saying, peace is not just the absence of conflict, it's also the uh, presence of justice. And um, so for me, it's, uh, do you also have the feeling that there's this, uh, there's this tendency to use peace uh, as if it means peace when it actually just means um, the fulfillment of my interests or the, the, the own interests of the own group? Because as you define that the, the uh, Oslo Accords don't really um, fulfill those um, criteria because they only um, actually address issues that are not the only issues that cause conflict, but the, the issues that con cause conflict are not actually addressed in it. But at the same time, I just wonder, um, maybe it's the reason for that is because the, the, the definition of peace is kind of slippery in this discourse. Like it's used as if everyone knows what it means when everyone who uses it means something completely different and sometimes contrary. Like, do you have any thoughts on that? I have many thoughts on that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, absolutely, that is true. But I don't think um, in, in the second way you, you phrased it, I completely agree. People are using it 
uh, as if it means the same thing, as if we're all talking about the same thing, but actually it means very, very uh, different things to us. At the beginning, it sounded as if you might be suggesting that they're using it cynically, which I don't think is the case. I think the second way you said it is more true that that people are talking about it as if they they all agree on what peace might be. But as you said, peace is not the absence of conflict, it's the presence of justice. But if justice is culturally relative, if justice is, the, then peace is also culturally relative. We cannot be, so I am actually, in what I'm doing, uh, I, I am uh, I, I'm kind of calling for the, the demoralization of the concept of peace. When you hear peace, don't get excited that, that people are talking about something you want to happen because God knows what they mean. <laughs> With that being said, <laughs> and now I'm getting back to, to Karma's initial question, like I, for, in terms of my own ethics and approaching these things, I, I try to at the beginning suspend judgment. You know, I don't know what you mean by peace. I don't know if I agree with that. I'm going to suspend judgment, be open to critique, try to be open to an idea that you might have a sense of justice that will challenge the very basic ways that I understand justice. And it might be a very legitimate critique of my worldview and, and, and put, a, put that on the shelf for the, for the time being. And it doesn't mean I need to accept everything, but for, this, for, the, for, the, for analytic purposes, not in general, obviously peace is a good thing. We all want peace on a moral level, but in terms of my professional identity and analytic approach to it, demoralizing the concept of peace. Okay. So we have one more minute for me, right? Yeah. And so I was reminded that this, this idea of, of, of various uh, concepts of, of peace also appears in Augustine, who says that yeah, everybody wants peace. That's something that is um, human. It's essential uh, to humanity. And sometimes the struggle is exactly about who will be the hegemonic, which will be the hegemonic peace. And the best peace wins eventually, or not the best, but the strongest peace uh, wins. Um, and I wonder if I understand that the, now you're, you're making this separation between your professional identity. Um, but since this is such a conceptual discourse as well, um, I'm wondering what kind of a theoretical alternative uh, you, would, uh, you would bring to the table in terms of eventually a society should perhaps choose one idea of peace to conduct or, or that's completely irrelevant? Um, not completely irrelevant, but I, I do think that I've been somewhat convinced doing this research that there is a certain extent of legal pluralism that will be required <laughs> in order to get to a solution to this, to this conflict. Um, I can give an exam a very short example, just uh, 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 as an alternative. And, and uh, on, on its face, it seems like a rather extreme way to get to a solution, but nevertheless, I, I found it very convincing. We were sitting in a meeting and with this, in this case, it wasn't the religious Zionists, it was between uh, Haredi Jews and the, the Islamic movement. And the, the Haredi Jews were saying, uh, uh, that the, the Temple Mount, from their perspective, can stay in, in Muslim hands until the Messiah comes. That's fine with them. And the Muslims the, from the Islamic movement were like, okay, interesting. Obviously, we're not going to sign on to like, a, to like, if that's what you need to get there, if you need to say, okay, we're going to sign that, that, you, that it stays in our hands until the Messiah comes, we need to talk about what it, what, how we're going to determine when the Messiah comes, who's going to judge that moment. But nevertheless, if that's what takes you to get there, maybe uh, we can sign on to that. We have our own definition. So everybody kind of coming to their own separate idea of, of what this might look like, as long as on a very pragmatic level, they can agree, maybe on the kind of ontological level, they don't have to necessarily all sign on to the same vision, potentially. Okay, thank you very, very much. So I think we're going to take the break now um, and uh, we will come back in 20 minutes, which means uh, 10 past four. Okay, um, so see you in 20 minutes. Bye bye. Um, it is my great pleasure now to welcome and introduce
uh, Nitsan Lebovitz. Uh, our paths have crossed several times in England, in Israel, in the U United States. I'm delighted that you're here to contributing to this Frankfurt event. Uh, Nitsan is a professor of history uh, and the APTER chair of Holocaust studies and ethical values at Lehigh University in today's embattled Pennsylvania. Um, he is, he has many areas of research uh, apart from Holocaust studies, intellectual history, political theory, uh, Jewish thought and philosophy. He is uh, the author of uh, The Philosophy of Life and Death, Ludwig Klages and the Rise of the Nazi Biopolitics, 2013. And his most recent book, uh, Zionism and Melancholy, The Short Life of Israel Zarki, which also is, uh, at least it seems, the basis for what we are going to hear today. Uh, he is the co-editor of several volumes, uh, The Politics of Nihilism, 2014, and of Catastrophes, the History and Theory of an Operative Concept. Uh, and he has uh, edited and co-edited several special issues uh, of journals such as uh, The New German Critique, Comparative Literature in Culture, or Political Theology and political theology in general is one of his fields of expertise. So Nitsan, welcome and thank you very much uh, for speaking to us. The topic is Zionism and melancholy, a double bind question mark. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, I'm sharing my screen here. I hope you can see that well enough. Um, okay, and uh, First of all, thank you and thank Karma, of course, for the, the invitation. I didn't uh, know Roy Ben Basat uh, in person, but of course, I heard about him from uh, mutual friends and acquaintances. And I was very, very saddened to hear uh, about his untimely death. Um, my paper today refers to uh, the topic he engaged with and that we engage with today, uh, and that is the uh, notion of tolerance. And I'd like to do something that is slightly more historical, but in a very broad political terms of the history of the political um, um, epistemology, let's say, of, of tolerance. Uh, that will uh, go back to some of the motifs uh, Menachem was talking about, and it will connect. Uh, with Erika and maybe later uh, also Merav, um, uh, as you will see. So I'm going to talk first about the history of the concept and the political social legacy, first in a more general context and then in a more specific Israeli-Palestinian concept, or at least the repercussions of, of which. Um, I'll first say, as mentioned, uh, a few words about the concept. And the way, and that's where I'm going to lead towards the end uh, uh, of the paper, into, I think, what we should consider as its more uh, current form, and that is uh, the, the notion of intersectionality. Um, and I do that, I suggest to do that via uh, the close relation between tolerance and melancholy on the one hand, and the, the way they actually stand in between um, the triumphalist narratives of sovereign uh, perspectives on the one hand, and then uh, the, the active resistance to those of, for instance, intersectionality. And I, both melancholy and tolerance are kind of a middle um, uh, mode uh, that connects uh, those two, and I'll try to show how. Um, and let me just end this uh, short introduction to, to the paper itself by saying that uh, by intersectionality, what I'm thinking about is how the active resistance to triumphalist narratives is trying to ground uh, their position in what uh, intersectional, and I'll explain that later, um, position is calling a structural group-based misrecognition um, and going back um, uh, from there. Okay, so first a few words about the legacy of, of tolerance and toleration. Um, I'm grounding my historical narrative here uh, on Rainer Forst and Michael Walzer, who talk about tolerance or toleration as a type or a regime. Um, and Forrest uh, divides that into four, largely speaking, into a typology of four, four kinds. And as you'll see, and that was uh, my, my question to Menachem before, uh, where it was um, coming from, uh, he's actually historicizing that somewhat, but a history that starts with the 17th century 
and ends uh, with the 19th, meaning that the space for developing uh, toleration or tolerance, the legacy of one uh, for our time, for the 20th century, and we'll get there. So uh, the first period is the period of edicts, right? And the period that starts in um, 1598 with the Edict of Nantes, uh, whose cancellation uh, abrogation actually starts, causes, is one of the causes, major causes, for the 30 years war that destroys Europe. So we have tolerance and then the, the uh, abrogation of tolerance is, is actually one of the worst incidents or causes of destruction in Central Europe. And uh, Faust actually takes this period of edicts from uh, that end of the 16th century uh, to Joseph II and the 1781 tolerance uh, patent. Uh, so up until the almost end of the 18th century, right before the French Revolution. According to that uh, perspective, from that perspective, the first period of tolerance is um, conducted under enlightened absolutism, right? Um, which is usually allowing, uh, in its grace, the minority to have a certain um, autonomy or a certain um, uh, certain rights, and, and of course it's um, it's limited. Uh, Force calls that the permission conception of tolerance. So that's the, the first period. The second period, moving again uh, chronologically, is what he calls the coexistence um, uh, tolerance. Uh, one that is based on the social contract, the period that takes us from Hobbes into Spinoza um, and is um, creating, shaping the social contract, the legal basis, that then uh, Spinoza is translating or taking further into a more multicultural or pluralistic uh, existence, again, as a political, uh, judicial, uh, political kind. The third model, again, moving uh, forward now into the era of the French Revolution and on, so the end of the 18th century and beginning of the 19th century is the model of respect or mutual respect, where indeed the concept of rights uh, is entering into the picture, into the discourse, and where tolerance, Paul says, uh, becomes a positive force. So Menachem talked before about the weakness, and we see how weakness actually evolves here into something that is seen at least as an active, to, to a degree at least, as an active or a positive force within enlightenment and the politicization of enlightened philosoph uh, philosoph philosophical ideals. Um, it's still, we should note, something that is granted by a sovereign, whether it is the French assembly or it is later Napoleon in the, in the Napoleonic Codex, um, and still, cre still shapes somewhat, is shaped uh, with a form, with a hierarchical uh, form of a sovereign allowing, granting um, uh, rights, certain amount of, of rights. The fourth model, uh, and here we're deep into the 19th century, is the model of esteem, where we talk about the legacy of the French Revolution, the Napoleonic Codex, universal values, and the German Aufklärung, specifically Mendelssohn, where we are talking uh, specifically about, about different plural, pluralistic forms where tolerance now is becoming stronger uh, as, as a form of securing the relationship between individual community and state. And we're talking about the, the of course, the period of the nation state now. Um, but interestingly enough, Faust uh, um, points out, this is also when, when tolerance is becoming the strongest in some ways in political social terms, it's also where it's weakness or at least a, a structure of negation is actually exposed. And that is, um, wherever we talk about tolerance, um, we see, we usually negate the power. We, we negate our own power, whether it is the absolute, whether it is uh, the sovereign, I'm sorry, or it is the, the autonomous uh, community that actually is granted uh, uh, toleration or certain rights. Usually the, the point is we universalize the language and therefore we negate the centrality of power in that uh, relationship, within that relationship. Um, Locke, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Faust and Walter is kind of in between the second and the third, is placed in between the second and the third models between the coexistence and the respect. Uh, we can talk about it later. And I want to move slowly forward um, and talk about um, Anna Ruajo, Michael Rothberg and others who follow Faust and Walter in talking about tolerance or this typology as shaping regimes of toleration, right? That's uh, Walter's uh, uh, term. 
where we talk about tolerance as a certain normative force. Again, you can hear here the, the gradual uh, uh, empowerment, uh, strengthening of, of tolerance as a political concept, active political concept, um, that allows, enables again, a certain multicultural uh, political shape uh, and to a degree because of the universalist uh, tone, also transnational and one that is based on again, mutual respect or esteem later and equality, uh, uh, equal rights. Again, false at that point and contemporary uh, critics even more so, uh, Wacho, Roth Rothberg and others uh, talk about the inherent problematic of that, which is that if all four types all four regimes of, of tolerance um, are built around that normative language. Menachem called it ethical, um, right? It's also one, and Menachem again mentioned that, uh, it's also one that assumes inherently a judgment, judgment of someone being wrong, right? Whether it is the parent or the sovereign. Uh, the sovereign power, whatever it is. So there's always the, the um, um, appearance of, of judgment, even when it's denied. So all four types have um, uh, judgment incorporated into them, as well as a certain understanding of conflictual relationship. Yeah. So we assume that there's a majority and there's a minority or there's a sovereign and the, you know, um, whoever is under the sovereign and tolerance is something that that helps create a dialogue between the weaker and the stronger. But the funny thing is, again, false points out is that uh, uh, power in that respect is, is always um, negated. And with it, judgment and conflictual relationships are very often hidden or are pushed under the, the rug. Um, um, so we don't always expose uh, those, uh, those terms. And in that sense, I think we need to talk about the fact that, again, coming to the 20th century, um, we're getting into, um, these are the four types, yeah? The period of edicts, the mode of coexistence, the mode of respect and the mode of esteem, and an inherent passive understanding of judgment and conflictual relationship, which is not very often exposed. Now, even within the active role that tolerance uh, receives in later periods, we need to understand that if we keep hiding the judgmental and conflictual relationship within that, which is a structural issue, we lock tolerance in a certain passive position in political terms. And that creates, of course, a problem. Now, in the engram, uh, you can see that in the background here of the, the quotes, you can see an interesting phenomena, which is tolerance as an active uh, uh, concept is uh, getting um, some prominence, let's say, um, in the middle of the 19th century, but it becomes a really important one in the beginning of the 20th century. So we tend to think historically about tolerance as reaching its peak in the 19th century, but in fact, the term itself becomes popular or conventional certainly normative, gaining the, the normative uh, undertones in the 20th century. And the question is why? Now, there are different answers to that. My own um, uh, assumption following again critics uh, uh, is that the reason is because democracy more than sovereign, more than absolute or monarchist uh, sovereigns before it has to actually hide its power, has to hide its uh, use of power including the, the push of tolerance into a passive position, right? Vis-a-vis -vis the, the function of power. Um, so with that, I'm moving into the second part uh, and I'm keeping an eye on the clock here to the second part of my uh, pres pr short presentation. And I want to say a few words about the, the double negation, uh, which is also a form of dialectical relationship, right? That is shared uh, between tolerance and melancholy and how that actually opposes again uh, in contemporary intersectional uh, theory. So let me state that or, or declare that uh, to you in a somewhat provocative way. My argument here today, and again, it's provocative, I know, uh, intentionally so, is that any political 
um, work with tolerance is necessarily a melancholic position. It's a melancholic position because it's again based on the um, double negation of not just one's position vis-a-vis -vis the present and the past, but the inability to admit the failures or the weaknesses. Yeah? Um, and I think it's not by coincidence that nowadays we see in the end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st, for the first time, a, an explicit uh, discussion of the weaknesses and the failures uh, of this concept and its legacy. Um, so in that sense, let me read the, the two quotes, and these are by um, different uh, uh, critics of the history and political conceptualization of, of tolerance. So Ana Ruajo and, and others, uh, it's a group of, of scholars who research the history. Uh, you can see the title of the essay, The Historical and Philosophical Dimensions of the Concept of Tolerance, argue the following, which is according to this logic, that is the logic of the different uh, types of tolerance, the whole raison d'etre of tolerance is shifted onto the conservation of public order. Um, Michael Rothberg, most recently in the Implicated Subject 2019, uh, referring back to Justin uh, Puar in the terrorist assemblages from 2000, 2007, um, explains that even, even more uh, succinctly in the following terms, Violence, especially of the liberal varieties, is often most easily perpetrated where its possibility is unequ unequivocally denounced. So again, the structure of double negation is at the core of understanding the function of tolerance within uh, contemporary society and, and its um, uh, failures or the problems it has. So specifically, and I want to narrow now the, the picture here to the Israeli-Palestinian um, position when we try to apply not just the strength of tolerance, but the weakness of tolerance as well to the Israeli-Palestinian relationship, I think what we see is the following, which is again a triumphalist narrative, and I'll try to use my case study soon to show you how that works. Triumphalist Zionist narrative on the one hand, uh, which again negates uh, the relationship to the past and negates its own uh, or those who the right, let's say, to actually discuss that openly. So there's a structure of double negation on the one hand. We see uh, that triumphalist narrative rejecting those melancholic positions who are inherently tolerant to the other, um, but accusing them of being exilic. Yeah. So belonging to a period where Jews were a minority and had to cope with that hierarchical uh, position. Um, and I think where, where um, um, I'd like to lead, or at least to, to examine that, is where that becomes uh, later on. So if that's the position of a triumphally Zionist narrative in the 1920s, 1930s, even before the establishment of the state, with the generation of Amos Oz and the 1960s, we see that position of toleration and melancholy become the position that is then identified with the triumphalist narrative. So there's a unity actually, kind of unintuitive unity, uh, growing um, um, affiliation of the melancholic and tolerant position with a triumphalist narrative and something we need to examine again more critically nowadays. This is inherently a minor position, but uh, I can say more about it uh, if you're interested later. Let me move uh, to the third um, part, and that is where we talk about um, how structurally we can talk about it and, and give some examples. So um, the double negation of tolerance and melancholy, uh, I think, is a good case for what um, uh, intersectionality calls a structural group-based mis misrecognition, uh, because and again, I'm trying to phrase that in very shortly, very crass terms. Melancholy is a double negation negating. And this is Freud's famous article from 1917, right, which Judith Butler uh, more recently uh, developed into a current political argument. Melancholy is a double form of a double negation. It negates the past. Think, think about the pioneers, the Chalutzim, yeah? They had to leave the exilic past behind. But moreover, they had to negate their own um, individual right or their will to mourn that, yeah? 
So uh, part of the of the condition of a Zionist uh, narrative was you it was not legitimate to actually even mourn the past you left behind. This creates a minor practice of cooperation or change from within. It pushes those supporting tolerance into a melancholic position where they cannot really fight openly with this course, that triumphalist narrative. They have to actually uh, engage from within by accepting the hierarchy, even when they push for a change. That is in some ways uh, similar, it reminds us of the structural issue with tolerance, which is again sits on a double negation of judgment and power, the negation of negation, which again locks it within a, a minor uh, practice or a change, an argument for a change from within, even when it's a normative one. So Zionist ideology in that sense pushes both into, um, uh, seeing both as an exilic phenomena. And that brings me to the case study uh, I'm talking uh, about in my book. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with the whole thing. I want to very quickly, I'll just uh, give you a very short um, again, summary of why that matter of the case and then uh, why it matters, and then uh, read a short excerpt from a dialogue which I think is really eye opening from uh, earlier period of Zionist narrative, um, Zionist history. So, Israel Zachi, my case study, born in 1909 in uh, Yenjev in Poland, uh, died at the age of 1947. Um, 38 years old, so very, very young um, from cancer, uh, but someone who suffered from ongoing depression, clinical depression, even though it wasn't defined uh, that way back then. He immigrated uh, from Poland uh, in 1928 uh, to Palestine as a Chalutz. He worked in different places. Among them, by the way, you can see the cover of my book, um, which is painted by the painter Rouven. Zachi worked in his orchard as a worker, simple worker, so cultivating the land in Reuven's orchard. You can see the orchard. Um, let me actually, can you see that? I hope that the, um, yeah, the pictures don't, don't uh, hide that. Um, so you can see that actually the orchard behind the camels and the, the sheep, um, yeah. Um, uh, between 1932 and 1947, Zachi wrote six novels and seven collections of short stories. He's known nowadays mostly as the father of Nurit Zachi, the uh, well-known uh, author um, who won uh, many prizes. And uh, he's known actually much thanks to a story of love and darkness by Amos Oz, who tells, and I had a short correspondence with Amos Oz before his death about that, uh, who tells a story of Zachi, his relationship with Zachi. So Zachi was a close friend of his father. Amos Oz, um, um, he was babysitting, uh, Zachi was babysitting Amos Oz sometimes when the father was working, the mother was, was um, uh, outside. Um, and, Zach, and Amos Oz came to see Zachi as kind of a, not only a father figure, but actually a model of writing, uh, of writing a, 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 a to literary uh, discourse uh, that became, or that I argue, I think, Amos Oz actually internalized in some ways. So we see again a topos, a certain topos of melancholy literature, the third point here, and a literature of tolerance, right? Uh, that is full, very rich with melancholic protagonists, uh, empathic to opposites and cooperating with institutions all at the same time, yeah? It is a, an explicitly a minor position that exposes serial failures. All of the novels uh, in Zalchi's uh, career are always depicting the failure of the Zani settlement but it's written in the voice with a discourse of um, a Zionist chalutz, Zionist pioneer. So there's a certain break between uh, the tone or the discourse and actually what is delivered underneath. And that in turn um, convinced his critics, Zalchi's critics, um, first among them is Josef Klausner, Amos Oz's great uncle, who called Zalchi's literature uh, a type of imperfectum. So Klosner and especially centrist or right-wing uh, critics were not able, capable to under, of understanding that this uh, um, miscoordinated discordance or, or um, you know, tension between the, the Zionist discourse and the failure, um, uh, the semantic failure, the semantics of failure that Zach is, is developing in these, in these narratives. And that fits, I argue, and that's the last point here in this slide, um, the position that Walter Benjamin in 1931 and Wendy Brown, the feminist theorist uh, nowadays, call or identify with left-wing melancholy. Uh, 
something that we know in Israel is very typical to the generation of um, uh, uh, Amichai first after 1948. There's a new book by uh, Mickey Glusman, Michael Glusman, who talks about that generation and the melancholy of sovereignty, as he calls that. Uh, and then Amos Oz with the Yorim Vebochim, right? The crying and shooting uh, uh, topos. And that brings me to uh, the specifically the, the case or the, the excerpt I wanted to read with you. So this is coming from, um, I'm going to read it aloud. This is coming from actually Yaakov Orland who wrote um, weekly reports rhymed weekly reports about meetings of the elite of Zionist intellectuals and, and authors during the 1930s and 1940s, specifically here the 1940s. And what he depicts in one of his, um, in one of these long prose narratives, prose uh, poems, is actually a conflict between Zarchi on the one hand and Uritz V. Greenberg, the canonical author of the right wing, right, of the Etzel of Brita Birionim, um, uh, of messianic political theology. And interestingly enough, it's actually revolving around their reading or their understanding of Freud. And here is uh, how Orland reports about it. And I'm reading from the slide. But Freud claims that Moses was an Egyptian. This from a groveling Zarchi standing right in front of him. Him is Uri Tzvi Grimberg. Suddenly Uri Tzvi paled. I had seen his face many times before, never as white as this. He hunched his back, his head between his shoulders and jutted out his chin, leaning against the fingers holding his cane. His voice dropped an entire octave and he sounded as if he were whispering. None of this belongs to Moses' Torah. We got this from the Gentiles. You surprise me. Even Gresonides and Rabad and Hillel the Elder uh, had trouble with this, but you have understood it all. But, Zachi would not relent, fire erupted from the mouth of the volcano, an entire floor shook, and Greenberg's voice echoed like flints crashing down, blazing like chunks of lava. Mr. Egghead, I tell you something, but I don't want to be sus suspected, of, suspected of idolatry. But as you are a Hebrew writer, you ought to know. Let me quote Tractat Chulin. Whoever teaches an unworthy disciple, disciple as um, is as one who throws a stone at Mercury. You should bring all your butts to your book club in Tel Aviv. They will print it in one of their journals. It's free for you, I'm sure. And by the way, Klausner does not say what you say. Did I say anything about what Klausner says? Zachi replies with a mumble, half elated and half embarrassed. And I think what, what you can see uh, in this excerpt, it's a much longer, it's about 20 pages dialogue going on and on about this uh, stormy dialogue on Uri Tzvi's, uh, Uri Tzvi Greenberg's uh, side, and this melancholic undertone, uh, shy undertone by, by Israel Zarchi, who's of course much younger, um, uh, is, is a paradigmatic moment of, of meeting between those two discursive positions, really, because that's what they represent, right? And you can hear behind that the Jerusalem versus Tel Aviv, and uh, the, the political messianism versus uh, secular tolerance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I'm coming to my conclusion. Let me just say, as a uh, before I actually conclude, last one anecdote, which is uh, when I researched and I found Zachi's archive in the Gnazim archive in Tel Aviv, um, it was like you know things fell into place right after another, almost in a miraculous way. One of the things I found was while reading the the Diaries is not only he calls, he keeps on calling um, calling Freud, Rabbi Freud, that's between himself, right, him and himself. So he really identifies Freud in the religious position of, of uh, a rabbi, um, but he actually identifies himself explicitly with Fabian, Erich Kessner's Fabian. Now, th those of you who know Walter Benjamin know that Fabian specifically is the paradigmatic case of Walters Benjamin's critique of Kestner as a melancholist, as a melancholist of the left, right? Left-wing melancholy. That's the essay from 1931. So Zachi explicitly identifies himself with the object of critique of Walter Benjamin um, as a paradigmatic case, uh, which you know is, is interesting um, for us here. Um, okay, and that brings me to my conclusion, keeping the time. <laughs> 
So um, going back from the case uh, study into talking about political principles and the structural issue I've been trying to develop here, um, I think that seeing tolerance as a melancholic form, even though it sounds negative, is actually not a negative uh, judgment on my on my part. It's actually an attempt to place it in a historical context um, as an interim stage between the earlier uh, enlightened discourse and the hierarchical structure of sovereign um, and uh, whoever is, is again, um, under the, the authority of certain uh, sovereign powers. Um, yeah, I don't want to call it, I explicitly avoid uh, political uh, um, uh, terms here in, in that sense. Um, and, uh, and in that sense, the, the what the 20th century actually brings to the fore, which is the failure of that position to actually move, mobilize, or shape into an active um, uh, solidarity between struggles. And intersectionality is a form of solidarity between uh, struggles. And I'll say two words about it and conclude with that. So intersectionality uh, is historically uh, a concept that is coming up in 1977 by um, the, where is it? Uh, I'm not, uh, oh, it's, the, well, it's just the, the link here, but you can see in the link the, the name. It's the Combahee River Collective in 1977, um, who um, it's a group of feminists, black feminists who in 1977 rebel against the socialist party or the socialist brand, uh, branch of the uh, student movement, uh, arguing that they push for a change, a reform that serves the institutions because it's done on the expense of black, specifically uh, feminists, but, but uh, blacks in general. And their argument is that without anti-racism and intersectional movement, you won't be able to turn um, actual critique uh, of that kind into an active force. Another group, uh, more recent, so, um, uh, in South um, uh, America, specifically Mexico, you can see that the second uh, line, Mexico Seminario Marxista Leninista Feminista uh, de Lesbianas, uh, is arguing for, and that's their term, uh, solidarity between struggles uh, from the 1980s. So trying again to push that position into an active uh, um, uh, critique. Kimberly Crenshaw in the later 1980s, Michael Rothberg is, is writing about her, is talking about the, again about the raison d'etre of socialists and social democrats as not as avoiding an intersectional struggle against patriarchy and racism, uh, avoiding and actually working against but again, negating that, negating their, their uh, weakness in terms of an um, anti-racist uh, campaign and one that is intersectional. So keep on negating that. And with that, I conclude, I think, um, I'm trying to actually bring that uh, back into a more general uh, understanding of uh, what we're talking about. I think that if we take this position seriously, I think we need to understand that a contemporary um, uh, struggle in the West in general and in the Israeli-Palestinian context in particular has to rely, has to uh, build on anti-racist and solidarity between, between struggles uh, as a form, as a shape. And this is something I uh, will say to conclude that I'm not just uh, arguing for in the abstract, but something that an organization I, I was involved with called uh, Academia Le Chivion, Academy for Equality uh, in the Israeli-Palestinian uh, um, uh, context is trying to advocate for in active terms. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nitan, for uh, this uh, not only uh, interesting theoretical uh, approach, but also for giving us an insight into your case study in the book. Um, we have time uh, for discussion and we can proceed the way we have done before. So Stefan Folk will observe the chat and also. Thank you, Dori. <laughs> okay. No question so far. So let, let me start um, um, from your conclusion, but also referring back to, to the beginning of your talk. It wasn't completely clear to me whether 
um, tolerance as a concept um, still has is still a meaningful concept for for the conflicts that that we are talking about. Um, I mean, you, you have uh, described the complexity and and the different uh, implications it can have, and uh, but. Uh, if I, if I ask you whether tolerance is still a concept that we should use, we are constantly asking us uh, this in our Frankfurt project. Is, is it actually a concept that should be used or should we return or not return? Should we, should we rather embrace concepts of esteem and respect instead? Uh, what would you say? Um, I think it's an excellent question. I think I'm a historian, right? So asking me about past the past of concepts is for me, or let's say let's uh, um, tackle that from the opposite perspective. Talking about contemporary concepts for me is um, necessarily talking about their past. I think we cannot and should not talk about contemporary conceptualizations um, of equality, of esteem, trust and esteem, respect and esteem. Um, contemporary understanding of, of intersectionality without actually taking into consideration the history of, of these positions, which is building, whether we like it or not, uh, on, that, on these positions and on the concept of tolerance. And, you know, without understanding the, the pros and cons, right, the strength and weakness of past concepts of ourselves as well, I and mean, this is uh, the first uh, uh, principle Freud teaches us, right, we can't understand the present, let alone move into the future, create a form of continuity. Um, and I believe that in a political, in a political form, I think that a form of political activism that ignores uh, the past of concepts, uh, the past of, of, of conceptualizations is actually blind to a certain degree to its own failures, its own blind spots. Uh, so for me, that's part and parcel of, of how we talk about the history of concepts of active political positions um, and about the form of, of continuity of our own you know, sense of self, for our own sense of self. I have a question by Rosa. She put it in the chat, but maybe Rosa, you wanna pose it also verbally. Yeah, I have a very bad cold, so my voice is not so good. Um, uh, I have a question. <laughs> it was a really, for me, a very fascinating um, talk because I'm also working on tolerance. So I, it's a very general question. Do you think that the term of tolerance is a specific and essential element of nation? So do we need tolerance? And what about intolerance in that case? Thank you. <laughs> Uh, you probably know the answer to that way better than I do. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, you know, one of the things as a, as a teacher in history, one of the paradoxes I'm talking about uh, with my students about when we read the history of nationalism is that you can't understand the rise of the nation state without understanding exactly that, that the nation state at its core is a liberal creature, is a universal uh, liberal creature that is built around uh, values of freedom, of uh, respect and esteem, right, of tolerance. Um, that the whole point of, if we're talking about the 1848 revolution of the spring of nations, right, and that's the, the concept is, is um, um, the, the, the term is in the concept, in, in the term, uh, is, is in fact to create a response, to shape a response, uh, a pluralistic one, a tolerant one, to uh, absolute monarchy, right? To the absolute monarch and create a certain collective or a community that is able to work in autonomous ways. So definitely, I think I'll, I'll say something even stronger than that. I think we cannot speak again, and that's, that's again the historical process. That's why the historical process matters, I think. We cannot talk about uh, this form of, uh, of development without taking into consideration that the nation state is ingrained in the understanding of a community of equals, right? Now, the fact is, and we cannot, of course, uh, negate that, that this community of equals necessarily has those who are excluded, right? Has to take into consideration, we have to take into consideration those who are ex excluded from uh, that community. And that might be either the internal uh, minority, the minority inside, 
the, the, the boundaries of that community or the outside uh, enemy or a certain you know, um, conflictual relationship in, in outside terms. So it's, and then again, you know, we can talk about how the two are, are, um, are shaped in, in the history of the 19th and 20th centuries, but in short, yeah, I think the, the history of nationalism has to take into consideration tolerance um, um, and pluralism and multiculturalism into consideration. We can't really talk about it seriously without it, but at the same time, without also including within that also the, the part that isn't excluded from it. Gilad is next. Um, th thank you, Nitsan. Uh, first, a short question of clarification and, and maybe the larger issue that interests me. So. When you bring the dialogue between Uud Tzvi and Zahri, you perceive Zahri as the melancholic of the two, and I would assume that Uud Tzvi is not a melancholic character, in your opinion. Yeah. Should I explain, or do you want to ask something about it? No, no, no. Say, say, I, 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 yeah. Okay, maybe, maybe I will add a question to that. Uh, um, it seems to me from your depiction that the concept of melancholy is entangled with with the concept of, of secularism to 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 a certain extent, uh, because when you read this text of Ovidio, it seems to me that he has no room for for for, for, mel for melancholy. The sources speak for him. It's it's not that he, he can enter this kind of of Freud reads Moses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, there is something stronger and, and, and more stable for him. And once you you go, you secularize the sources and, and you take a certain distance from them, then a certain sort of melancholy emerges, let's say. Yeah, definitely. Um, so you connect two things. One is the, the conflict between Zalchi and, and Atzag, and then um, melancholy as a secular or um, whether it serves uh, in a context that is not secular. Yeah, um, so let me first start with Zarchi versus Greenberg. Um, Zarchi, I read as a melancholic uh, for different reasons. Uh, can you see me, by the way? My connection is seems not to, okay, work that well, but fine. Um, I read Zarchi as, as a paradigmatic melancholic thinker. Um, for different reasons, I, I'm not going to get into it now. Uh, you can read the book; uh, it's it's all there. But um, but specifically within that context, because the position he presents here uh, is one of again trying to advocate for a tolerant position from within that uh, that um, uh, that negates or that uh, um, fights with the primacy of power speaking. Right, so that's a structural structural issue. And Atzag is actually someone who exposes that everywhere. In his poetry, in his speeches, in his dialogues, he always exposes or speaks for power. Now, you can like it or dislike it. I'm not saying it's beautiful. He's, he's Hebrew and uh, his use of sources is, is amazing. I mean, it's absolutely mind blowing, but he speaks from the position of power. And in that, he is considered to be by people in the time during that period, as the representative of messianic politics, right? A certain messianic political position and someone who will be able to actually unite again. And this is also Klausner's. It's not by coincidence that Klausner and, and Uri Tzvi Greenberg are closest friends. Um, the, the two of them are pushing for an identity of the political structure of the state and the uh, messianic uh, political theological argument that, that uh, wants to, to unite. Uh, um, the, the theological and the political, right, in, in some ways. Um, and that's not a mel melancholic position. That's a rebellious, active, uh, um, open, um, power-oriented position that has nothing to do with melancholic. If you like to talk about it in, in, in psychological terms, um, and I'm not saying uh, Uri Tzvi Grinberg is not a sad person sometimes, but if so, and I think he is very often, he kind of falls into the, the depre man, uh, um, uh, manic depressive kind of type, not the melancholic type. And Freud distinguishes uh, the two in, in very strong terms. Now, I'll just say one last thing about it, which is 
Um, when Freud actually depicts melancholy in 1917, he warns us of something that, again, Judith Butler is, is applying in political terms, and that is um, Freud's argument is that the, the structure of double negation will lead inevitably melancholy into a fetish, will turn uh, melancholy into a fetish. Historically speaking, my argument here, again, um, uh, following the history of Zionism, is that if the generation of Zalchi and the early uh, writers of, of the state in 1947, 1948, are actually good representatives of a form of classic as if the, the original position of melancholy, the generation of Amosos already fetishizes it, fetishizes melancholy. Yorim Vebochim is a fetishized position, right? Um, if you think about it. And again, we can, we can talk more about it. But that's the historical, um, uh, the, the historical accompanying, again, a structural development of the, the terminology itself, the, the typology uh, itself. And finally, uh, yeah, I do identify melancholy with uh, a secular position. I think it's very difficult. You can find melancholic uh, voices, uh, um, especially, I think, uh, in, in texts, in, in religious texts. I'm not sure you can actually hear much of it, at least not nowadays, um, in, in the public sphere. I can't hear much that is really melancholic in, in, in religious terms in, in contemporary Israel, at least, M maybe in, in outside Israel. But within Israel, I wasn't able to hear much that answer is a melancholy or a mi uh, uh, minor, minor, minor scale, you know. Um, um, talking about theological, political structures in, in the minor scale, let's say it that way. One more question by Erika, but I want to ask Christian if there is enough time because we are already a little bit behind schedule. Christian. I think we can take this one question and then we have time in the end for more. So my, my question is really connected to the last thing you said, uh, which is, I, I want to ask what you mean by minor. Uh, because that was the only part that really confused me because uh, I th I, what I thought when you meant by minor and maybe it was minor like minor scale but I thought minor as in uh, like minor literature or minor as in small uh, uh, in which case I thought no this is the hegemonic position until 20 years ago so that maybe it's a really really short answer. <laughs> Uh, I'm following here uh, again the Deleuze and Gattari's discussion of, of Kafka right and their own uh, reference to Freud uh, and to the understanding of the minor scale as a minor language uh, attempting to undermine what they call major languages from within. And in that respect, the minor scale or minor literature, again, think about Kafka or their argument about Kafka, I don't necessarily agree with them, but, uh, but their argument about Kafka is that Kafka uses the minor literature, minor voice, minor scale in order to undermine the major language, the, the hierarchical and sovereign language uh, discourse that he's uh, trying to rebel against. But again, this is an internal deconstructive uh, subversive voice working from, from within, not from the outside. Yeah? But is it possible that in Israel this has become the major voice? Like this melancholy minor voice has become the like I don't know it just seems very hegemonic. Uh, yeah, so so okay. here's the thing, and this is uh, you're completely right. I mean that's that's why I mentioned Oz here because I think that with Oz that does become for twenty years, no even less, that becomes the hegemonic or the you know the peak of the social democratic uh, uh, Zionism. You know uh, adopts that after the the Milchemet Shtaimim, the Six Days War, as the hege hegemonic voice. And of course, in 1977, we see that uh, uh, flipping upside, right? Flipping up. So um, from 77 and on, I think the, the melancholic voice is um, basically pushed back into the background. And it's interesting, by the way, to see there's, there's an attempt by the, the, this uh, social democratic left nowadays to make it fashionable again, yeah? Uh, more Lush, you know, the documentary, Aslili Magnuzim, you know, is the typical, I think, uh, uh, melancholic movie. Uh, it's, it's, it's infested with melancholy, yeah? So there's an attempt to actually um, uh, bring that back as a hegemonic voice or as, as an ethical uh, leading normative position, but there's no, there's no chance that will ever succeed because we're speaking now a different language. I think this is a lost fight. We need to move forward. We need to move into, into terms that are, again, uh, focus on, on anti-racism uh, uh, and, and, um, and cooperation between struggles, yeah?
Thank you, Nitsan, for your analysis and also the provocative elements of them. Um, we are now proceeding to the next uh, fourth talk of our symposium. And uh, I'm delighted that uh, Mayor of Jones has joined us from uh, Ontario. Um, she is a political theorist, so from history to political theory, assistant professor of religious studies at McMaster University. Uh, she completed her PhD in political theory at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in 2013. Uh, the topic was actually referring to images of Israel in 17th century English political thought, so political theory and history. And since then, she has published uh, chapters, articles on religious sources uh, on Hebrew images in the political and legal thought of the modern Western culture. Uh, she, uh, before coming to Canada, which was quite recently, uh, she had postdoctoral and teaching positions in Jerusalem at the Hebrew University, at the University of Pennsylvania, but also in Tel Aviv and in Yale. Welcome and thank you for agreeing to be with us. Thank you and thank you for inviting me. Um, it's very fitting that I should speak after Nitsan and particularly after that talk, I don't know, um, Karma had some insight. She said I could speak about um, a, a variety of things that I was speaking, that I could speak on, um, and this has worked out really well. So anybody who still had questions for Nitsan would be able to ask them at the end of my talk and feel quite comfortable. Um, okay, so I'm gonna speak today on religious ideas that can help us think beyond sovereign toleration for Israel-Palestine. Um, so thinking beyond sovereign toleration, I'm not going to claim that toleration isn't a virtue, um, but that sovereign toleration, which is this toleration that is part of the model of the sovereign state in the 17th century, including John Locke, um, is limited by sovereignty itself and by the approaches that sovereignty allows to otherness or to the other. Um, so my talk is going to have three parts, and I'm going to speak specifically on Israel-Palestine. The first part is to talk on how and why Israel-Palestine is stuck in the model of sovereign, the sovereign state and limited by sovereignty. Um, in this part, I'm going to claim that to some extent, the political theory that followed the Protestant Reformation and the political structures and institutions that were born at that time um, actually create the Jewish state, first in ideas and then in practice. Just as Catholics were to be separated from Protestants, Jews were to be separated from Christians and Palestinians from Jews. Um, sovereignty is about territorial separation. Toleration in sovereign states, or what I've termed in some of this talk, sovereign toleration, presumes that the tolerated are a minority. And to the extent that this is just, it's because this minority is a majority elsewhere. So that is, um, that, that I'll explain. Um, sovereign toleration, I will find as an, an unsatisfactory model for addressing religious and cultural difference in the world that we live today. Um, and that's for at least two reasons, but I'll focus on two. The first is because it doesn't let us see the other as other properly within the state. And this relates to Christian's question to Menachem. Um, the others say the Catholic in Locke's letter or the Jew gets to be other elsewhere in the model of Westphalian sovereignty. They can be tolerated in the, in the Protestant state, the Catholic and the Jew can be tolerated in the Protestant state to the extent that they can be minimally the same, um, which that's the limit on atheism is that the atheist is considered as someone who can't be minimally the same. Um, they have to be able to participate in the civil religion of the state. Um, this speaks to the conceptions of the person that are relevant in the state, and I'll speak about this. Um, the second reason that sovereign toleration isn't satisfactory is that it presumes that every group can have their piece of land or their place where they are major a majority and it predicates toleration on this. Um, I think this is very problematic, particularly in our world as we're seeing more and more peoples um, voicing themselves as peoples, um, but we don't have another conception of sovereignty or even territory in the modern world that isn't connected to the division of land. Um, the second part of the talk will be short. I'll be claiming that um, just as sovereignty itself is born in a particular religious moment um, with religious resources, um, resources for looking beyond the limits of sovereignty have also been religious. And I'll give the example of Jacques Maritain very briefly and his conception of the person. Um, and I'll point to the fact that this was politically effective, um, being able to turn to religious resources. I'll then take Maritain as an inspiration and look at whether we might be able to find local religious resources and particular, I'll look to Jewish resources for looking beyond the limits of sovereign toleration for Israel-Palestine and particularly the limits which I spoke of 
in just a moment ago of the person, the, the type of person that can be um, accepted in the modern state or seen in the modern state and the other one about division and borders. Okay, so starting with the first part. So I promised I was gonna speak about how um, 16th and 17th century foundations of modern sovereignty create to some extent the Jewish state and even the two state solution. Um, so I turned to the 16th and 17th century because this is really a transitional moment for toleration. And I'm sorry I was late and I missed Menachem's talk, but I understood from the questions that he spoke to this. Um, prior to the 16th century, Europe understood itself as more or less homogenous. Sure, there were non-Catholics who were on the outskirts of society, but either they belonged somewhere else, like Muslims who had their own empire, or they belonged nowhere, like Jews who may someday convert. But in the meantime, their existence anywhere was tentative. They weren't citizens, but special subjects with an outsider's purpose. Um, they served Catholic society until they were expelled for becoming a burden. Um, Jews could live in the same areas and be brought into disputation or they could impart Jewish learning. But in all this, they were other um, or just beyond the limits of a more or less homogenous um, Catholic Europe. What happens with the Protestant Reformation is that Europe meets religious diversity for the first time. Rather than one religious, uh, one Christian religion, there are two, um, then three. And eventually, after the Peace of Westphalia that I'll presently discuss, it was acknowledged that the same religion may have local characteristics or look different um, in different places. The immediate effect of this diversity that hits and rocks Europe is um, warfare and bloodshed. Um, Following the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, Jean Baudin, who is today remembered as the father of modern sovereignty, writes six books on the Commonwealth, theoretically laying down the foundations for the Peace of Westphalia that would be signed in 1648 and explaining the move in the Peace of Augsburg in 1555. Um, Baudin writes that the sovereign is the highest power to command. So this is how we're going to resolve um, the wars of religion is to have a sovereign who is the highest um, power to command. The sovereign is to decide on all matters within his territory, including the currency, symbols such as the flag and the anthem, religion, and more. Religion in the state is to be under the jurisdiction of the sovereign, so the sovereign would decide in advance on religion within the territories and uh, within his territory, and that would avert wars of religion in this, within states, that the sovereign would decide on which religion was going to be dominant, that religion would be the religion of the state, minorities would be tolerated to some extent, but if you had a Catholic state, there was also to be, nearby there would be a Protestant state, and so the, the toleration of Catholics in Protestant states and Protestants in Catholic states was sort of a barter deal. And we can see this also in Locke's letter of toleration. Specifically, he's, he talks of the possibility even of a Jew being a, a, um, a part of a, a subject in a Catholic state. He doesn't rule that out that that couldn't happen, but it's sort of, he, he's interested in that as something that could happen. It could happen that a Catholic is a, is a subject in a Protestant state, but what, it's clear, what is clear is that we have a, he, a hegemony, some ruling, Nitzan spoke to this, um, some dominant majority and minorities are treated as outsiders in, in the public sphere. And the assumption is that, that they are majorities elsewhere. Um, so one interesting aspect of the political theory of the 16th and 17th centuries that's often overlooked is that the Jews are addressed in this political theory in a new way. Um, just as Christian diversity was considered to be best, best managed by walls and borders, the idea was raised that the same should be tr true of Jews or Jewish religious difference. Um, Judaism, we have to remember, like Catholicism, is a um, religion that Protestantism understood itself as having overcome. Um, but Jews and Catholics persisted. Their adherence needed to be politically accounted for um, in order to avert war at that moment. Um, Jews may not have been a political problem, the way Menachem says of atheists. They weren't, they weren't necessarily a political problem when Jean Baudin was writing. And also not exactly when Thomas Hobbes was writing, but we'll come to this. Um, Jews had been expelled from England in 1290 and from France in 1306. Um, so when political theorists at the beginning of early, the early modern period addressed the Jews, they were addressing the problem of the paradigmatic religious other or religious otherness in general. Jean Baudin wrote of the Jews that in adhering to strange religion, the Jews caused other people to most grievously hate and condemn them. He also at the same time learned political wisdom from the Jews, this being a people who had once been ruled directly by God. And he found that the Jews sometimes had the most correct understanding of key political concepts that he would lean on. So he brought Jewish wisdom into his thought. Um, his contemporary political conclusion on the matter of the Jews is that in the absence of land, the Jews would be unable to protect their religion and liberty. 
after all, in the world of sovereign states that Baudin was imagining, um, every people needed to have its own land in order to be protected. Um, in the mid 17th century, when Jews were already becoming a bit more of a practical concern, um, Thomas Hobbes in Leviathan considers the case of the Jews. Now, civil religion for Hobbes in Leviathan is the glue that sticks society together. And Hobbes points out that even in the Roman, that in the Roman Commonwealth, the Jewish religion was the only religion that was not um, tolerated. And the reason being, of course, that Judaism itself is incompatible with civil religion, according to Hobbes. Now, just as Hobbes is um, publishing, Oliver Cromwell is starting to discuss in England the reintroduction of the Jews. And James Harrington, who's remembered as a Republican thinker, um, took Hobbes's text and um, Baudin's approach to the Jews speaking of the absence of land. And when, just as Cromwell is about to reintroduce the Jews to England, Harrington writes a major work called The Commonwealth of Oceania. And there he proposes that rather than reintroducing the Jews to England, the Jews should be given their own land to live under their own laws and institutions um, in perpetuity, that to accept the, the Jews into the Commonwealth by any other way but to maim it, um, that the Jews would suck out the lifeblood that would otherwise sustain a useful member. Now, when Harrington proposes giving the Jews land, he proposes giving them Ireland, um, which would, of course, displace the Catholics in Ireland. And that's another aspect of sovereignty, um, which we need to acknowledge that there can only be one dominant people in any territory. OK, so what I wanted to illustrate here is that when Europe was first confronted with religious difference, it treats uh, that it treats politically rather than as separate. So actually not just allowing the Jews to be an exception, but actually trying to theorize them within the state. Um, what it does with religious difference is separates between religions with territorial boundaries. This is part of the essence of sovereignty. It's how sovereignty resolves wars. Um, and there's sort of a barter deal between different groups, um, which is what, what enables toleration so well in this, in this system. Okay. And we saw also that this is already extended to the Jews in the 17th century. Um, and I think that this is also, if we read further, I'm not going to go over, go through um, Zionist diplomacy in the 19th and, uh, and early 20th century, but we do see that this same logic of um, the Jews not being able to um, comply with civil, to be, that the Jews are not compatible, Judaism is not compatible with civil religion, um, and that Jews might not be the types of people who we want their religion um, public, in the public sphere, um, and that this might demand that they be able to be a majority elsewhere. This is part of what um, is the impetus for the Zionist movement and then allows um, Zionism to get the support it needs um, in large part from England, which is where um, these texts and this approach to the Jews develops in the 17th century. Um, okay. Now, I want to say that some of the problems we see in tolerance um, in Israel-Palestine relate to this sovereign model, um, which resolves conflicts by dividing um, between conflicting pa parties and places territorial borders between them, and which doesn't require us to see difference within borders, um, but only beyond them. Of course, the Palestinians are still stateless, and many in Israel reject partition. Um, refusing to accept the, the European model of territorial division. But the most tolerant in Israeli society or those who are considered the most tolerant, the peace camp, build their visions of peace and their toleration on sovereignty and on partition, which is inherently limited and doesn't force us to really um, deal with the content of difference. And not, that's not just true now, but that's true also in the vision um, of sovereignty for, uh, of a two state solution or of, of sovereignty. Um, and I think that we need to start to think beyond that and think what alternatives could there be, um, both because this sort of interim situation in, in which we don't have um, two states has become a much more constant reality than we would have imagined. And also because I think there's something really um, left to be desired in the situation um, in, in sovereign toleration itself. Okay. So now I come to the second very short part of the paper, asking what resources we have for thinking outside the box of sovereignty. I promise to turn to religious sources and to Jacques Maritain. Um, I can say in general that one of the most interesting things when you look for academic writing beyond sovereignty is that it's Catholic, um, almost invariably. That, um, that when, you, when you read a text, you're like, oh, this sounds familiar, and then read about the author, and it turns out he's Catholic, and, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, here I'm going to 
focus on Maritain's personalism um, to give an example of a religious idea that looks beyond the sovereign idea of the person and actually changes something in world politics, um, breaking down some of the um, sovereign boundaries by contributing to international law and setting a standard that nations are supposed to live by. Um, so in 1948, not only was the State of Israel established, but the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was um, authored and redacted. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights addresses the rights of human persons rather than of citizens, and it's predicated on an idea of the person that was absent in the 17th century. A Catholic idea of the person that was developed and promoted by Jacques Maritain, and not only Maritain, it was a community of thinkers at that time, but Maritain was very strong in promoting it, um, as an alternative to both sides of an ongoing debate in Western political thought regarding the question of the primacy of the individual or the primacy of the nation. And I'm actually going to take us back for just a very, very short moment to the 17th century um, to see how this plays out in just, just in the work of Thomas Hobbes, um, because I think that there we get a really nice vision, which doesn't depend on nationalism, but just very basically on sovereignty, on um, what happens. It's pre-liberal um, and pre-nationalist, but on why this might have happened. Um, so to establish the idea of sovereignty on, in modern political thought, theorists ask us to imagine ourselves in a state of nature. In the state of nature, the people are bare individuals where each is out to gain at the expense of all else, even at the expense of the lives of others. Sovereignty, there's a, there's a war of everyone against everybody. People can't live in this situation in which they are bare humans just struggling to be alive because someone's gonna kill them. Um, sovereignty is imagined as established when these individuals make a particular type of contract, a covenant, establishing the sovereign that sets up laws and institutions that will protect their lives. Sustaining the sovereign becomes the way to sustain one's life um, post sovereignty. And so there are two persons in this story of the establishment of sovereignty and the sovereign people. The first is the bare person prior to the social contract. And this comes in later in, um, in liberal philosophy, the, the person, the um, unencumbered self or the person behind the veil of ignorance who's making political decisions. Um, the second is the person of the state where the individual is merely a part. The Leviathan that's composed of bare individuals um, where people give themselves up to the sovereign. So if anybody's ever seen the frontispiece of Hobbes' Leviathan, it has this huge um, figure, which is the, the sovereign. He's holding a scepter in one hand and a sword in the other. But if you look really, really closely at that picture, you see that he's made up of tiny, tiny bodies that are indistinguishable. That all these people, like they're, they're equal <laughs> in, in the sovereign because they're all just making up a part of sovereignty, just as the bare individuals in um, prior to the state were equal. They were all, they all had the same desire for life and the same ability to, to kill and to die. Um, the only distinction would, would have been between the, the relative strength. Um, so we do have equality, but we don't really have personhood um, that's deeper than either. But in the pre-sovereign um, situation, this bare self and in the sovereign situation, um, being just a part of the greater um, whole. So Jacques Maritain offers us an alternative to get out of this distinction between the bare person um, who's prior to the social contract and the person who is part of the Leviathan, which he reads as the distinction between liberalism and totalitarianism. Um, turning this into Hobbes um, explained by Maritain is my own um, invention. So please don't tell anybody that, that Maritain was interpreting Hobbes. Um, what Maritain proposes and pro promoted as an alternative um, was his conception of personalism, where under personalism, the individual who contracts to make to enter into political society in any way, prior, who is prior to political society and who lives within it, is not bare. It's not possible to make a person um, bare or indistinguishable from other people. Um, but this person has some commitment and affiliation, and this is the person's direct, unique connection to God. Um, to Maritain, this is what it means to be created in the image of God. Each human person is an end in himself with, and his connection to God is different to anybody else's connection to God. It has, um, because he is this um, unique person with a connection to God, this person is an end in himself. He doesn't need to any higher end. Each person is an end. Um, and that ha has certain inalienable rights attached to him, this, ver this personhood. Um, it has, you have to be, each person in this conception um, has to be able to have his or her unique, um, authentic connection to God. So the freedom to have that connection needs to be given, which means um, the basic rights of life and everything that life demands. Um, 
they need to, people have to have religious freedom, people have to have a life of dignity with everything this entails so that they can have um, this, per, so they can be the person they are, which is really um, part of the purpose of humanity itself. Um, so Maritain's personalism was very successful in building bridges between nations. Um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was signed in December 1948. Um, critics of this Universal Declaration of Human Rights point out that while persons may indeed have these rights, uh, without states, they won't be granted them and won't be able to take them. Um, this relates to the problem of political agency, um, which um, is a problem in Maritain's person. Um, Arendt spoke of the problem of the Jew being, ha having been turned in her time into a pariah people, even having um, made a pariah, the pariah into a political ideal. And um, what Mary Ten's personhood gives us is basic rights. Um, but if we need someone to give us these rights, we risk, um, or even if, if we could get these rights without a state, we risk being a pariah people to some extent, um, people being pariahs in the sense of not needing to be part of political society in order to achieve their personhood, because personhood is really about some, to some extent, withdrawal from political society. Um, what we need from political society is really just basic needs, which we, if we can find a way to do that, um, then we don't need, we don't need to be political people. We can just be with a connection to God. Um, so that's, that's a critique I have of this personism, which I, I'm not, don't think it's enough to sort of fill the gap that we have in, with, um, the, with what Maritain notices is the gap between liberalism and totalitarianism. I don't think we have a rich enough person um, really to think politics. And I think what we're missing are other types of affiliations that are really essential um, to, to personhood and to human experience and to human political experience. So what I, what I like about Maritain is that I do think that he gives us a richness of a person that is missing before. And I like that he turns to religious resources for overcoming some of the setbacks of um, liberal individualism and totalitarianism where we just become part of the whole. Um, but I don't think it's enough. This isn't a critique of Maritain. Um, he was a theologian, not a political theorist. And I think that it's up to political theorists to think about how can we use these ideas and push further forwards. Um, and that's where I'm going now. I'm going to the third part of my talk. I'll try and keep this short too. How much time do I have, Karma? Am I up? You can take your time. Five minutes, maybe. Five minutes. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to turn to religious resources, which might it might be a bit controversial when I say religious resources. I'm not turning to the Bible. Um, I know that might be a primary religious text, certainly for Jews and um, other religions, but I'm um, not looking for a biblical Israelite perspective. I'm looking to see what um, experiences Judaism, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm looking to the, to the Jewish in a, minute, in a moment also um, recognize that. I'm, I'm looking to Jewish history and tradition as it has evolved to see how Judaism itself, like Catholicism, which grew up without statehood, how Judaism itself might have developed alternative um, conceptions of personhood and of political space that might help us um, overcome or contribute to some of the um, political discussion to overcome some of the setbacks of um, sovereignty, sovereign toleration, the, the person that can be seen um, within these structures. Um, so, Regarding the person, and, and I'm looking at this for Israel-Palestine, I mean, I think that we need to be looking for local resources, and I think that Jewish history is a local resource. I think there are other histories that are also local resources, and soon I think you'll see how um, my understanding of Jewish history is going to help um, Jews in the state of Israel connect to Palestinians in ways that wouldn't have been possible um, in the liberal conception, the sovereign conception. Okay, so regarding the person, um, I think that what Ma that Maritain's co conception of the person, the person as an end in himself, um, certainly works with Judaism. The idea of the person being created in the image of God, having a direct connection with God, um, works with Judaism. Um, but the, but it does fall short um, because group affiliation and communal identity are really essential to what it's been, what it has meant um, historically to be Jewish. Um, being Jewish has meant in the absence of statehood for most of Jewish history, being affiliated not just with one single group of people, but with multiple groups of people. Um, so Judaism has involved hybridity. And I think that um, Nitzan would agree that this is a type of sort of intersectionality if we want to take um, the term. 
but I'm not sure. Um, the Jewish individual who's a member of a Jewish community is also a resident or a citizen of a different country. They're usually a member of various organizations, causes. Um, I think statelessness itself made the Jewish person hybrid. And even in the state of Israel, the history of statelessness has meant that hybridity is part of every person in the state. Every Jew is Ashkenazi or Sephardi or Mizrahi, has a unique history of movement and migration that has shaped his or her person to such an extent that it's prior to their belonging to the state or to the political. Um, and it gives each person a group of belongings, of things they belong to. Um, any covenant between Jews of different backgrounds needs to take this into account. Um, and this is a very different starting point for a social contract than between bare individuals. And what's interesting is that this is a foundation for covenants between the same foundation, which could be for Jews between different between Jews of different backgrounds, gives a completely new foundation to the possibility of covenants between Jews and Palestinians, because some of the affiliations and some of the hybrid identities that Jews hold um, might be connections that Palestinians also have. They might have relation, pl places of birth, um, connections to the same places of land. They might have histories in the same countries, family histories. Um, and also just recognizing the hybridity and the complexity of the person changes what the negotiating table looks like. Because if, if the negotiating table is allowed to consist of persons, each with their own um, history and multiple identities, um, then seeing the other is not just seeing the other as one as, as a member of one group or as a detached individual with rights, but it's seeing another complex person with, with multiple affiliations, some of which I might be able to relate to, some of which I can't, but I can certainly see a much richer um, group of affiliations. And I don't need to see the person in front of me as just representing my enemy group, say, or the, the, the group that I'm warring with, because each person um, can be identified as having multiple um, affiliations. I know this is controversial. I see, I see people in the room like blank faces. I'm not sure if this is helpful, but I hope so. Um, okay, so that's, that's, my, that's my take on how Jewish, the, the Jewish person might contribute. Um, I think this certainly speaks to Buber and to Arendt, and I, I could go more into that at some time. I'm still working on this very much a work in progress. Um, but I'd love to talk about that. The other place that I can see an intervention um, from Judaism into sovereignty is on the question of borders um, and whether we need borders to distinguish between groups. So of course, from what I just said about hybridity, um, you could imagine that we might need a different conception of space. Um, something that I looked at a couple of years ago and that I'm now thinking about in this context is a Jewish conception of space that developed in um, Jewish law, which is about the structure of the Eruv. Um, this is a permeable boundary that allows Jews to carry outside their homes on the Sabbath. Now, what this does, it's, it's an invisible line that sort of goes around the Jewish community and extends each Jew's home into the, um, into the public space in an invisible way. So Jews can imagine that their home is actually not, doesn't end at the border of boundary of their house, but they can, um, their home extends to the edge of the Eruv, which might be, say, four kilometers diameter. And so within that space, they can carry and they can have their communal life on the Sabbath, on the Saturday, but even though that is not permitted, it's not permitted to carry outside one's home. So the Erev is a, um, is a boundary that can't be seen by anyone who doesn't know it's there, um, that allows people to have communal life without, um, not by setting borders between them and other people, but by extending the home outwards. Now there's something else the Erev demands in order to make this invisible boundary, you need to buy for the purposes of the Sabbath, the homes of the non-Jews that are in your midst or of those who are not part of the community. So you have to explain this religious practice, this communal practice to the non-Jew and have your religion acknowledged by them. And I think that this act of mutual recognition of who's living in the territory, in, in, the in the political space, and then some way of containing the community, um, of having it um, together without rigid boundaries and with something permeable um, could be a different way of thinking of space that comes from um, within Jewish tradition. And that has been really overlooked and completely like overturned by sovereignty today in the Jewish state. If um, a rabbi wants to create an error, they ask permission of the rabbi of, of the police in Tel Aviv if they can put a border there. Um, so this is now, it's now being completely um, superseded by sovereignty. But I think there might be something there for speaking about alternatives, particularly when we see 
that the Erev as the, as the structure containing the Jewish community ends in the mid 16th century when Jews are forced into ghettos in Europe. Um, the ghetto is this sort of rigid wall that that's something the Jews end up accepting just as they end up accepting the state. Um, but before that, the Jews did have their own ideas of space that could allow um, for more mixing and more hybridity. Anyway, that's what I had to say. Those are my ideas. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mirav. That was um, wonderful. Uh, very interesting, insightful. And we still have time. Um, so if there are any questions, the usual procedure, you can just indicate uh, in the chat. I can really see a hand. Right, Eric, Oma. I saw her and Oma, yes. Mm. Kama is first. I'm sorry, it's too, too much technology. I'm already very tired. Thank you so much. Uh, it was so interesting, um, really. And uh, OK, so I, I just I was wondering um, about the way that you, you, you um, play with, with Meritain ideas. And, and, and I thought that there, there was one concept that I was wondering, what's, what's this concept place in, in what you're doing? And this is the concept of the body of Christ, right? Because the, the, the various individuals, they don't only, the way in which they relate to God uh, in the Catholic tradition is not only a, a relationship of the individual to God, but together as a community, they compose the body. Which is very interesting because it's it, it clearly corresponds also to this modern political conception of the Leviathan, right? So, um, so I was wondering if this is also something not only the personhood of the individual, but what is the place of this body of Christ, um, uh, or or how could you um, do something with that in order to criticize the uh, uh, the concept of, of sovereignty that you uh, wish to criticize? And what is more, um, what, what else I thought about, I know Jacques Maritain from his writing about the synagogue, which is another concept. And he, he, sometimes he also uh, discusses the synagogue in relation to, the, to his political ideas, but I don't think any work was done exactly on that. But of course the synagogue is another concept of community. Um, and I, I'm not sure how, uh, what kind of work he does uh, with this concept within his um, political thought. I was wondering if you have, any thoughts on either of, of, of these communal uh, perceptions there? Thank you, I think that's really interesting. Um, the idea of the person that I mentioned is really what's emphasized in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in that sort of promoting human rights after the Holocaust. Um, and I think that's really important that he doesn't um, emphasize the body of Christ or the connection of, uh, of this new person that, that could be created. On the other hand, I do think that it speaks to another limitation um, of Catholicism and maybe where we can create a conversation with Catholicism and bring com Catholicism into conversation with Protestantism. And that's this question of, um, I guess I would say imperialism um, of this, like, because the body of Christ is not limited by international borders, right? When, when persons um, unite and, and, and address God as a body or um, connect with God as a body, then there's something, um, that there's some universal in, um, aspiration, um, even, just in, even just in the term Catholic. And I think there is a fear of that. I think that's part of the reason why um, this sort of fear of Catholic imperialism, I think that's part of the reason why contributions of um, Catholic thinkers to political theory is going to be limited. Um, and this sort of the overcoming of the limitations of sovereignty, but also by moving away from um, from individual peoplehood and towards a um, universal connection with God um, or a universal Christian connection with God. Um, I think it's I think it's problematic, and I think that we need to have the conversation to bring out these ideas so that we can talk about that more. Um, I think it would be much more interesting if that was what was being discussed in the negotiating table and we had the synagogue and the, and the body of Christ and what do we do with these ideas? I think we might actually um, even move forward in, in new interesting ways. Thank you very much, Mira. It uh, will be next. Uh, thanks for, for a fascinating uh, talk, Mira. A quick question. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, while you're talking about the, 
And of course, whenever now, after meeting you uh, four or five years ago and hearing you talk about Westphalia and the peace of Westphalia and all that, you know, whenever I speak about it, I think about it, I, about you. And um, I recently read an article uh, by Nancy Fraser, actually, who talks about our moment in time as a post-Westphalian moment. And the reason she actually talks about it in those terms is because that's, it's a moment of, of how she defines it, um, uh, whose uh, most pertinent characteristics is one of, of uncertainty. And, and it's interesting because that's a slightly different understanding, uh, semantics than, than hybridity, right? Which she actually talked about before in, in relation to different forms of justice and tolerance. And she says, now we're moving into this notion of uncertainty. Now, uncertainty actually is not about space, it's about time. And, and it made me think, you know, when, when you talk about the Rouv and you talk about Maritain and you talk about, you know, hybridity in these forms, whether you're not talking actually about a form of a, a temporal form rather than a spatial form, um, right? I'm thinking about Heschel's understanding of, of Shabbat, of the Sabbath as, as a temporal form. Bonnie Honig now is, is talking about it in contemporary political terms, right? Um, or I'm thinking about uh, Edward Bering, who's, uh, I don't know if you know his recent book, uh, Converts to the Real. You love it. You have to take a look at it because one of his heroes is Maritain, and he talks about him as someone who's actually uh, shaping Catholic theology together, bringing Catholic to, uh, theology together with uh, French and German phenomenology as a temporal form. Um, and that is, of course, something he brings with him then to Chicago uh, and into that convergence between Leo Strauss on the one hand and Hannah Arendt on the other. So I'm, I'm wondering if there's something there that, um, I don't know, might, might project a different light on, on that, um, that typology. So I really appreciate the question. I think there's um, definitely much to be said for, for looking at the temporal. I have a problem with post-sovereignty um, in the sense that, as you said, uncertainty. Um, where's the content? Um, I think that if we want to create a content that is temporal rather than spatial, if we want to think in some way um, about giving positive content to post-sovereignty, whatever that is, um, we need to do work that's not actually being done. And that's what I was trying to do. Um, to start to do in this talk. And, and I think that that's, th there's a problem with the post. Every time we speak of the post rather than what it is that we're doing, um, we end up with something that we're going to, eventually we're going to get past the post, right? <laughs> so the question is, if we, are we going back to sovereignty or are we going to, by that time, have something more certain to talk about? Um, and it could be that what, what we're talking about could be some sort of temporal, some theory about temporality rather than spatiality. It could be some mixing. Um, it could be something much more flexible, but we need to start talking about what is going to, um, to be the next model. And people are already talking about post-post sovereignty. Um, one of the interesting things about post-sovereignty is that we never really left um, sovereignty. <laughs> Nothing would be next on the list. Um, Mirav, thank you so much for your talk. It's such a pleasure to see you. Um, uh, and uh, what I like especially about, about your talk is, um, is the thickness of, of, of communal life as a point of meeting between variegated communities. I think that this is crucial here. You're also replied to karma is um, um, was 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 right on the dot. And I'd like to just mention two two anecdotes that for me symbolize this very strongly. One has to do with Erica's talk as someone who was for years involved in 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 religious peace activism. Um, we uh, could never bring Shalom Achshav to understand that you cannot make rallies on Shabbat and expect, and expect us to come. Um, this turned, this is such a secularist, um, um, Nazi secularist statement um, um, that completely alienated um, the bulk of Israeli um, um, peacemaking in the 1980s from the religious community. Um, it, uh, beside its complete political stupidity, the obtuseness uh, 
um, was is so glaring um, that um, it, this is one example. And, and an example in the exact other direction um, was a wonderful Palestinian family from Nablus, from a, a village near Nablus that, that built our house in Jerusalem. And I remember uh, while they were working, it was Ramadan, and, and, and my wife Dvorah and I, we brought them food at the end of the day um, and to, to sit and have the iftar with them um, on, our, on our bare roof. And we're sitting together, and he asked me, so where, where from Europe are you? And I said, listen, my family came here at the beginning of the 19th century to Safed. And he looks back at me and says, in the Palestini. You're a Palestinian. And I said, I didn't know what to say. I said, yes, you know. So um, the, the thickness of, of life um, uh, undermines uh, um, the, sometimes to such a great extent, the, the, the structures in which so much of official politics happens. Um, and, and, and there are many, of, of these overlapping um, of, of these overlapping uh, communal discourses that 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 exist, but um, but are never brought never really brought together. Um, so I I, um, I just want to acknowledge the the, um, the importance certainly in my life of, of of what you're trying to do. Thank you. have Erika. Thank you. Uh, I really uh, enjoyed the talk and uh, in particular the, the Westphalian state system is also a pet peeve of mine so uh, it's good to, uh, to hear these ideas um, but I also wanted to share with you just uh, on, on the basis of the kind of field work that I've done and the kind of ideas I've heard um, people bring uh, just not as a, a challenge at all, just as uh, adding to the diversity that you're offering here. It's not only um, doing away with sovereignty, but really starting to play with the concept and starting to play with, change the concept from the very rigid uh, Westphalian uh, model to start of, you know, uh, a state, state sovereignty over a specific population, over a specific territory and play with uh, these ideas, whether it's state sovereignty versus God sovereignty, whether they can coexist, whether they have a hierarchy between them, whether they can shift, whether they can argue with each other, these type of ideas, or also let's say uh, you can have sovereignty over a population, but that population isn't necessarily contiguous. And maybe we can play with those kind of ideas when we're trying to find a solution, or maybe we can have parallel sovereignty where I have sovereignty over this, but you also have sovereignty over this. If, there's, if there can be such a thing, like these are the kind of ideas that people are, are talking about and playing with that I feel like are also really, really contributing to the, the ideas that you're, that you're bringing. That's all, just. <laughs> Absolutely, and I really appreciate that um, intervention. There's also um, another problem in Israel with sovereignty, which is that the term has been hijacked. Um, you're talking about sovereignty over. I wouldn't speak about sovereignty over when I'm talking about sovereignty in the Westphalian conception. Sovereignty is self-rule. Um, so to have sovereignty over is, a, is almost, if you, you can compare Wikipedia in Hebrew and Wikipedia in English on um, ribonut versus sovereignty, and you'll find very different um, understandings. I'm, I'm working on an article on this. A couple of things have actually already been published. This is really, a, it's an abomination. Um, but there is, but it is important to notice that this, that this, it's not an unnatural progression. It's not an, un, like, it's, it's not completely out of the blue that people would start to talk in this way of sovereignty over, um, considering um, the extent to which, I mean, if you just think of Hobbes's, um, the, the guy is sitting over. So, if, if you imagine that there that there's that there are people in that 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 they're sitting over not just themselves but also also others it's not it, it is something that we need to talk about and yes to be more i think i i think we need to start offering some alternatives um to sovereignty not just in how it's been interpreted in israel but also um in general thank you Thank you very much, Merav, and also for all the questions that were posed. Uh, we are coming to, to an end of uh, 
this symposium. Um, and even though in the program it says concluding remarks and discussion, uh, first of all, there's not much time left. Secondly, it seems pretty difficult to me to even think about uh, concluding or summarizing uh, or giving perspective based on that. Let me just say a few words, first of all, from the perspective of this Frankfurt project, which I presented uh, in my initial thoughts. Uh, it's very interesting that apart from Apart from or even Basat's project, the concept and the term of tolerance does not appear. Um, it has, I don't know whether it's a reluctance to embrace um, a concept that has its difficulties and its complexities, or whether we have so strongly focused on this concept of positioning that there is no space for, uh, for this uh, other concept of tolerance, toleration. Uh, but I'm specifically glad uh, that today we discussed this and we, we got a glimpse into, first of all, the, the richness, richness, the complexity, the multifacetedness of this concept, um, maybe also of its relevance for future political uh, discussion, especially also for uh, its historical death. So I'm very grateful to all of you who, um, who also uh, spoke about the historical dimensions of, of this concept and how it developed until uh, the present. Um, I think there would be many questions open to discuss, uh, and this is really an inspiration for us to continue this discussion, for example, but we cannot, we cannot go into this, but um, um, a question that always shows up when you talk about tolerance and toleration, which also plays a role in Rainer Faust's book, is the limits of toleration and tolerance. Um, we haven't touched that. It, it's a very uh, complicated issue, but also an important one. Uh, I'm very grateful, especially to Merav about um, for mentioning the question of of the um, let's say the relevance of Jewish thought and, and the Jewish religious tradition for um, for discussing these questions, especially of sovereignty, territory. But in general, I have the question from our project. Um, is there something like a specific contribution or a specific potential that Judaism, that the Jewish tradition, that Jewish political thought, also secular, offers to discuss these questions of political, religious, cultural difference uh, and uh, and conflict? Um, I'm I'm myself for me myself. I I can draw a lot of uh, interesting uh, perspectives from what I've heard this afternoon. And um, something that, that fascinated me was uh, what uh, Menachem said at the beginning when he was talking about the wisdom of tolerance uh, and then mentioning uh, the idea that there should or could be a theology of tolerance. Uh, that's something that, especially for our project, is really inspiring. Um, also the, the fact that this leads to ideas about uh, epistemic humility, uh, about esteem, about respect, and how this relates to the, the many dimensions of tolerance. Uh, so from my part of point of view, um, this has been wonderful. And um, thinking about Oib and Basad again at the end of this symposium, uh, I can only reiterate what I said at the beginning. He would have loved to be part of this. And it would have been wonderful to have him here because he would have had something to contribute to our discussion. And I can not thank you enough for, for being part uh, of this event, the speakers, uh, those who uh, participated, who participated in the discussion. Um, and unless there's, uh, there are things that, that you still want to voice, I don't want to just end and disrupt <laughs> the event, but I wanted to express that at, at the end of from my point of view. But there should be space also for you to, to say a few final words, the speakers, if you like. It's over. Thank you. Thank you. Very good to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you.